Austin, are you all cut? Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Dairy School Board. As usual, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to invite the kids up from Grinnell to lead us. Thank you all very much. We love having student help. So everyone is here tonight. Our next order of business is to approve the minutes from May 4th. Motion to approve minutes on May 4th. Second. And are there any comments before we vote on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. And next, to approve the minutes from May 10th. So moved. Are there any comments before? All, Brenda, do you have a? Yep. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. With that, I will invite Mary Hill up and. So I have to touch her because I love her. <laughs> Mandy Luke is here as our volunteer person this year. Um, whether it's pre-COVID, during COVID, maybe someday post-COVID, um, Mandy is there for us. Um, you can call her and she will make time to make sure whatever you need to get needs to get done, she gets it done. We have her at all our events. She's, she's there to set up, she's there to clean up, she's there to run activities. Um, most importantly, she is a popcorn person. <laughs> and you, you think it's just a little thing in life, but one less popcorn bag can make a difference in somebody's world on that day. And she is careful to make sure that everybody gets what um, they need. So I wanted to honor her tonight, knowing that we have many years still together. But the work that she's done already, I greatly appreciate it. So Mandy Luke. She's in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. We don't just give these to anybody. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for what Thank you do. You. Thank you. So, Allison and Sarah, if you guys want to come up. I so, should just add before Mary goes on, I misspoke earlier. The whole board is here, but. Marion, uh, the superintendent, Connors Corn, is joining us virtually tonight. So she is listening in, and for all you kids, she is excited to see what you have to present, and she is watching. So I have to touch them too because I love them. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we love you too. Thank you. So um, Allison and Sarah came to me earlier in the year because the Department of Ed put out one of those notices that sometimes we just delete right away, and sometimes you read them. And I was so glad they read this one because it was about running a chess club and what chess could do for children and help them in their learning. So they said, is this something you'd let us do? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> so they, um, they went, they got training, and they um, brought this wonderful club to our, to our school, which included 109 students. We have 328 and 109 students participated. So amazing. So the other thing I want to highlight beyond this is pre-COVID, we had tons of activities. Then during COVID, we had a back off, and we're just dabbling back in. This fall, we had a running club of 32 kids. Our band had six. Our spring running club had 20. Chess club had 109. PALS, 18. Our PTA enrichment this last past three weeks is going on. 100 students are attending. Unfinished learning, 53. Yearbook, 20. 20. I could <laughs> We also, with our CSI funding, we're running um, family nights. The money came in after January, but two K family nights, two first grade family nights, two second grade family nights, and three through five, we tend to get a less attendance, so we combine three to get three to five together instead of individually, two nights. There's, um, we've had several, and several are still happening. 
Title I had their annual read aloud and their activity night, an author visit. They had geometry night, and then they ran two, three clubs in the morning, um, creative thinking club, and then two brick building clubs. And then the summer, we're going to have stories and swings to have families in for our incoming kindergarten students, and three weeks of STEAM camp that we're getting out of ESSA funds um, because it didn't fit into our CSI where we thought we couldn't have it. She, the, the information went out, and within two days, we only had two spots left. So these are all things that our kids love and our families love. But the big one tonight is the Grinnell Gambit. Okay. okay. So um, I'm Allison Strobel. I'm currently a fourth grade teacher. I'm Sarah Ogden. I am currently the PACE teacher. Um, so we have a little presentation to just introduce um, how we got here, and then we've brought some students with us to share their experiences and perhaps play a mini game with um, some board members. So. Here we go. <laughs> so, so pay attention. It starts with <laughs> the granite gambit. Like Mary said, there was an email sent out over last summer, um, and they always send out different professional development opportunities, and this one just kind of jumped out at me, um, and then Sarah and I talked about it. So um, through a partnership with the New Hampshire Department of Education and Chess in Schools, there's this statewide initiative to bring um, chess and education to the schools. So we had the opportunity to join this training um, and we became certified level one CIE instructors, so chess and education. Um, along with the program, the training was free, four days of um, intensive training, learning how to play chess, which I was not an expert at and I still don't consider myself an expert, but we're always learning and growing and that's kind of what we help teach the kids, growth mindset with that. So along with the certification, um, it also provided both of us with um, chess sets, demo boards, which are really large boards that we can show moves and things to the kids, as well as chess-related incentives, some keychains and mini game boards, as well as 100 gold level memberships to chesskid.com, which is like a $50 value um, per student per year. So that was really a great tool that we used. Um, so we brought it back to school and we decided to kind of structure it, work our way down from the upper grades. We began with fourth and fifth grade we held three separate five-week sessions of the club and we met once per week for one hour. Um, fourth and fifth grade started out in the winter, second and third grade after Christmas, and then first and kindergarten we did just before April vacation. So the way the chess club goes is each meeting had a specific lesson plan that we came up with. The goal with chess club is to have at least 50% of the time the students are actually playing the game. So we teach them a little lesson and then they get to apply it and play games with their friends. Um, with the fourth and fifth grade, we were able to work all the way through the basics and ended with a quad tournament of mini games. In third and fourth grade, we um, got through a little bit slower pace, but we did end with a tournament. We did it online through the Chess Kid website, which was really cool. And then first grade and kindergarten, they learned how all the pieces move and how to play mini games. So we didn't quite get to the same level that we didn't expect to with the littler kids. So. So mini games, a lot of people, I didn't know what mini games were before we did the training, but it's really a great way to teach the basic moves and how the pieces move through smaller puzzle-like games. Um, some examples are across the board, the pawn game, the knights versus pawn, homecoming chess, which teaches them the positions, um, queen versus pawns, and losers chess, which is like the opposite. <laughs> some of the visuals we provided the students. We had Promethean boards um, way back at the beginning before all the other schools got them. And we really used those to our advantage. We had the display up. Um, it would help the kids visually see in addition to our demo boards. So homecoming chess, the goal is to move your pieces to their starting position. It helps them learn that. Another example of a mini game, queen versus pawn. So the object of the game is for the queen to prevent any pawns reaching the eighth rank and the object for the pawns is to get as many. Um, once they're there, they're safe, so. Chess Kid is the website. <coughs> Excuse me. Chess Kid is the website we used. Um, all the students got an account. Um, the older kids, we got the accounts pushed out to them before chess club started so they could kind of front load, get a little background knowledge for the kids who had never had experience with chess, which I don't know why doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
So the older kids got some experience, and then um, the other kids, we taught them how to use it in chess club, and the kindergartners and first graders, we showed them, and then we kind of pushed it out to them afterwards as an additional resource. So they're all on there and, and active. Um, and one thing we took away from the chess training were the benefits of chess, not just how to play a game of chess, how to win, but thinking like a chess player. And it's a lot of critical thinking, really good skills that the kids can take away from chess club and apply across the school day. Focus on the task at hand, assess the situation, consider your options, decide, plan ahead. And then here's um, where we get to sharing the kids. The Dairy News came and visited us one day, and here's a little excerpt from their article that they published. We have Aiden and Anna playing chess. Um, Aiden liked to have fun, and for Anna, she really liked to keep a sharp mind deciding her next move. Here's some other pictures for you. <laughs> they had so much fun. They just loved to be with their friends and play the game. And so we have um, a little video from a couple kids that weren't able to join us tonight, and then we'll bring up our friends who are here in person to share as well. About chess club. <laughs> okay, so I like chess club because I learned how to play the game. Uh, I like chess club because I learned new tricks and tips for chess. I like having a website to help me learn, and I like being able to see the possible moves and win the game. Thank you. Goodness gracious. So I know you probably couldn't really hear him. Ben said that he liked to learn how to play chess he had never played before. And McKenna shared that she liked to play with her friends and she really enjoyed learning how to see moves ahead and win. That was her <laughs> key piece. <laughs> All right. Nope, oh, it's gonna play again. So here we have fourth grader Ben and fifth grader McKenna. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> and before we get to the next part, we'd like to invite all of our friends up here. So come on up, guys. Okay. All right. So if you here, if you guys want to, if you feel comfortable sharing, great. If you don't want to, that's fine too. But just come up and tell us your first name and your favorite thing about Chess Club. So who wants to be the brave first? You don't. Know. You don't know. All right. Come on. Um, my name is Maddox, and my favorite part about chess club was um, learning what is checkmate and what is check. Very interesting. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, differently than going forward, we learned the pond captures how? Diagonally. Diagonally. Okay, so side to side. So we're going to play a game called Cross the Board, and it is the pond game. And we have McKenna and Ben back to give us a little introduction, and then we'll jump back to the rules after that, maybe, so we can have them fresh in our mind. <laughs> All right. Hopefully it's loud enough this time. So Ben and McKenna are going to show us how to play pond versus pawn. Okay, so the first thing that you do is the first turn that you can do, you can go two, but the rest you can go one. So if I would here, I kind of would have to do a move. I could go here, but then Ben could take my character. By going across, you can't take it like straight. You only take it across, like diagonal. All right, so would you guys like to show us a quick game? Yes. Good. White always goes first. Ben and McKenna are also playing with touch move. So if you touch a piece, you have to move that piece. You can't put it down and pick up a new piece. favorite part of the movie is when you see Ben just kind of thinking. He's like, all right, I made my move. Is she going to do it? Is she going to fall into my trap? Because you can like see him just sitting there. And that's one of the benefits is they learn to see several steps ahead of just their first move that they're going to make. All right, so if you guys want to find Well, we got to go over the rules first. OK, well, maybe we'll let them set up their okay. pieces while we go over the rules. So. Okay, so the game is played with only the pawns. The pawns move as in chess, either one or two squares on their first move and one more move after. Captures are made diagonally. And whoever reaches the opposite end gets one pawn to the other end, wins first.
For the, the price of a couple professional days, the state the state um, provided them with the games. Um, who was the person that gave us those beautiful chess games for the window? Oh, um, um, the gentleman that we were in training with. Neil. Neil. 
Yeah, he and gave Neil us... And, Neil and Jean gave yeah, us some... They, they brought us some display chess boards to put up in the building. They, though they had bigger ones, um, chess boards to look at, as well as kids use their body to think about where they would move. So I greatly appreciate it, and 109 students now how to play certain aspects of chess. So yeah. maybe Maybe ladies. next year we can get them to a tournament. That's what we're hoping. That's what we're hoping. So thank you, guys. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming and especially thank the students for coming. It is great when clubs become an extension of the day and give kids a chance to show what they've learned and had fun and expand their mind all at the same time. I think this is a wonderful club and I'm so glad so many kids participated. Yeah, I just want to add something as a student myself. I remember when I was a young kid in elementary school as well, and I used to be so jealous of all the other students who knew how to play chess because I never learned. So I love that Grinnell's offering this opportunity through um, a club to teach you all these strategic thinking skills, and it was awesome to get to play with you. Yeah, nice job. Who says learning isn't fun, right? Absolutely, and uh, thank you to the staff for what, all the extra work that you do all the time. We really appreciate it. Uh, remember, I am uh, filling Mary Ann's uh, shoes tonight because she can't be here. Uh, I bet you nobody knew she has size 12 <laughs> shoes, but anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, she would want to say this is the best part of our meetings. We love when the schools come over here. We love honoring our fantastic volunteers. Uh, we love seeing the kids. We love seeing the families coming out. Thank you for doing the job and getting involved with our schools. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you to your staff. And thank you, all you kids. Thank you everyone for coming and I would echo what Austin said, school presentations are always our favorite thing, in the, thing of the night and it's the reason that we are so excited that the COVID protocols were lifted so that we could have you guys back to remind us why we're here and show us what you've learned. So with that we will take a five minute recess and then we will go back to our regular meeting.
Good evening, everyone, and we are going to come back into our meeting. Thank you, everyone, for your patience, and I hope you all enjoyed the Grinnell presentation. We are going to now move on to personnel, and Dr. Garofalo is going to take it from here. Okay, I'm going to start with some uh, professional staff uh, nominations. Gwen Bergman, math interventionist, Ernest P. Barker Elementary School. Shannon Barubi, physical therapist, district level. Kaylin Carter, math interventionist, West Running Brook Middle School. Caroline Colbert, science teacher right here at West Running Brook Middle School. And Janelle James, math interventionist over at Gilbert H. Hood Middle School. Yes, so can I, oh. Move to approve as presented. A first by Brenda and a second by John. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. I have three resignations. Ginger Drexel, Assistant Principal, West Running Brook Middle School. Gerald White, Assistant Director of Student Services, District Level. Kristen Yetten, Pace Language Arts Teacher, Gilbert H. Hood Middle School. Um, three outstanding professionals who have given um, excellent service to this district. Uh, we will miss them, but we wish them well in the future. Move to approve. As Austin said, um, they're leaving some big shoes to fill, but wish them very well in their next endeavors. And thanks for all they've done for the children in Derry. Second. A first by Brenda and a second by John. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. And good luck to all of them in their future endeavors. And um, last but not least, uh, nominations for administrators. I want to remind everybody that I am reading this for Mary Ann. Um, this, she's so proud of uh, our administrators in this district, and she wanted to say, tonight, I am most proud to nominate the administrative team of the Dairy Cooperative School District. Although I an, am unable to uh, attend this meeting in person, you can be assured I am watching and that my heart is most fully present. The Dairy School District administrative team being nominated this evening worked tirelessly on behalf of all students, staff, families, and community members to form meaningful connections. These connections are a reflection of teamwork, perseverance, and a commitment to excellence and ongoing improvement. Through many unanticipated challenges this year, the administrative team has embraced the positive pursuing the district pillars of learning, growth, and connections with selfless and incredible dedication. They are dedicated to putting students first. The kindness, genuine concern, and welcoming environment that they create for our district families and community serves as a tribute to each of our administrators. I encourage them as a team to continue to leave their footprint of kindness, meeting students where they are, passion for excellence and improvement 
sincerity, and the important ability to connect and care. The footprint will undoubtedly result in an indelible mark on the countless lives one student at a time. With most sincere and endless gratitude, Mac, Mary Ann Connors Krikorian, Superintendent of Schools. Austin, do you want to read the names, or do you want to just approve it as you've read you've, at, with the nomination you've made? Right. Uh, okay. I, I, my understanding is I just say all administrators, or okay. I just wasn't sure. Yep. <laughs> I didn't want to Thank make you. a motion and then have to stop. Yep. Um, motion to approve the uh, nomination for administrators as presented. Second. First by Brenda. A second by John. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion passes. Next on the agenda. We are glad to welcome back Jacob for a Pinkerton Academy update. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well tonight. So there are a bunch of different updates that I'm super excited to share with you all. First being that the junior prom occurred two Saturdays ago at the Hackler Gymnasium. It was the first one at the gym sponsored by Pinkerton since the pre-COVID days. So all of the past proms that we have had since COVID began have been either unaffiliated with Pinkerton created by the parents or in other locations. So this was the first one back to normal in the gym. The theme was Enchanted Garden and it was amazing to see all the decorations that the junior class of 2023 officers put up for everyone. So, so, so many thanks to them. And second, we also did revise our student dress code recently. So there was a board of student leaders and just general administrators who recognized some gender-based inequalities within the student dress code system and just wanted to create a more relaxed and lenient dress code just to resemble more closely what professional working attire should be like. So they just relax some of the restrictions that have been in place just to ensure that students are not targeted for certain clothes that they do decide to wear. Next, with regards to the Air Force Junior ROTC program, Nika Lai and Nora Scott, who are both sophomores currently, have been chosen from two out of 132 nationwide cadets to attend the Air Force Junior ROTC Cyber Academy. Basically, they are sponsored to go on a scholarship to various programs. Nika is attending a six-week virtual program this summer, and Nora is going to a two-week one at Norwich University. So, so many congrats to them. Again, it's an amazing achievement to say that out of two people, out of 132 in the whole nation, we're from Pinkerton and are able to go on a scholarship for the Air Force Junior ROTC program. Next, the underclassmen awards took place yesterday where various freshmen, sophomores, and juniors were awarded for their hard work in a variety of academic subjects and extracurriculars. So again, congrats to everyone who was awarded. There was a huge list, and if anyone is interested in seeing that, feel free to go to Pinkerton. So next, for student liaison applications for next year, they did close May 13th, and so I was gonna update you all at the last meeting, but I wasn't here. So essentially, applicants may be no next meeting, and I could probably share them with you then, and there will be the whole voting process if we do have more than one candidate, and ultimately, we will decide the next Dairy School Board Pinkerton student liaison. And moving on from that, the dance club is having a performance tonight. It actually just started at 7 to 8.30 at the Stockbridge Theater. It is $10 per ticket, and all proceeds go to dance scholarship funding. And so that is just one of the annual performances that the dance club puts on together. Moving on, Senior Movie Night is again happening tonight from 7.30 to 10.30 p.m. at the Fisher Cat Stadium. It's amazing to see that we're having this tradition formed and just carrying it on in person, again moving away from those COVID times where we had to resort to more virtual matters. Next, the Spring Instrumental and Choral Concert is tomorrow from 6.30 p.m. until around 8.30 p.m. in the Stockbridge Theater. This is the final concert-based performance for the Pinkerton Music Department this year. It's a great way to say goodbye to all of the musicians, whether they're in band or chorus, and the seniors who will be having their last concert. 
And But if you do want to see some more performances, Pinkerton is also, the band specifically, having its Hooks It and Dairy Memorial Day parades this weekend. Sunday is the Hooks It one, and Monday is the Dairy one, respectively, for the band to have its final overall performance. And so if you are interested in seeing us all march together as the Pinkerton Marching Band for one last time this year, please come to either the Hooks It or Dairy Memorial Day parades. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob. As usual, your presentations are not only informational, but they're very entertaining, and we really appreciate that. So, awesome. thank you so much. We thoroughly enjoyed having you here this year. Thank you. I appreciate it. Providing that. updates. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. You too. So, our next ag item, ag agenda item tonight is the facilities committee presentation. I did hand them out to the audience to various people so that folks can share. Um, we will have a question and answer period afterward for the public before we talk as a board. And Jay and Eric from LaValle are here to answer questions. You can go to the next slide, David, please. So just so people know where we're going tonight, I wanted to give people an overview of how we got to the point we're at with our facilities decision and then talk about our timeline for moving forward. Then we will take a look at, have a discussion about the new school and renovation discussion. People should remember that in April, the school board voted that, they were that we were gonna go forward with the proposal to close two schools and open one. After the presentation concludes, we will have public comment and questions either to us or to Jay and Eric or to Jane, depending on the question. Then the school board will discuss and then we'll tell you what the next steps are in the process. Next slide, please. So this is a little hard to read, but what I wanted people to see is how historically over time what's been happening with facilities. So this timeline actually starts not at the exact beginning because there was a community facilities study one and I couldn't find exactly where that started, but it was even earlier than 2015. And since that time, we have had numerous demographic study updates. We've held master plans. Just one of the questions out in the community that is a very legitimate question is, why our buildings need attention? So first, what I want everyone to know with no uncertainty is our buildings are safe. Our maintenance team of five people is very diligent at making sure and addressing is often the first thing cut when we need to cut our budgets. Just one thing for people to keep in mind, our newest building is 17 years old. That's Barca, our oldest, our 60 or 70, year, 70, or 70 years old. And the reason we have challenge with budgets is because our costs keep continuing, the cost of retirement, the cost of health care, the cost of special education, while our revenues are decreasing, adequacy aid, catastrophic aid being two of the big ones. Next slide. So I wanted to tell people a little about building aid. This is for educational purposes because it's a complicated process that we've been learning. Building aid comes up every two years. So in January of this year, we were told that we had to put in a letter of interest if we had interest in applying for building aid. And that would, and if we didn't, and that would allow us to apply for building aid this July. But if we didn't do that, we would have to wait until two years. Building aid comes up every two years. Because Derry is a cooperative school district, we can access 45, our building aid rate is 45%. That's if we get the full building aid award. That does not always happen. The average rate is more like 38%. The process with projects are July 1st, January of 2023, and then we would have a final answer in the spring. Now what will happen is whatever goes on the ballot next March, what we can do on the ballot is say this warrant specifies that we are only moving forward if we receive building aid. So voting to approve a project doesn't mean you are necessarily approving it no matter what. You can approve it saying if we get building aid, and that is something that towns have done. The way building aid works is 80% is distributed at the start of the project and 20% is distributed at the end. But the warrant would cover the total amount because that is by law how building aid works. Next slide, please. So I also wanted people to understand what building aid does and doesn't allow. Building aid allows new buildings, additions, substantial renovated studs, rebuild it, then you could get building aid for the roof. Building aid also doesn't allow preschool construction. Next slide. 
So I wanted people to understand this also goes to the question why now about building aid history and this is something as a facilities committee we, we've been learning about. So building aid started years ago in the 1970s but what's important for people to realize is that in 2010 there was a moratorium on building aid. So from 2010 to 2017 there's no building aid distributed and in 2013 there was a slight change to the program and then in 2018, 2019 and 2020, 21 there were very small amounts of building aid distributed. So when we've been talking about things starting in 2015 or 2013 whenever we had that first discussion there wasn't, there was not building aid available to do the projects we were talking about so it was not something we could even consider at that time. This past year this is not fully funded and we can't be assured this will be the total amount but it is worth noting this is the most building aid they've given out since before 2010. So this is a real chance that we have to look at if there's something we want to do. Next slide. So I just wanted people to be able to see what's, what projects have been approved by building aid. So for fiscal 20 and 21 there were three projects in Rumney, Haverhill and Summersworth. In fiscal year 22 and 23 there were two Allenstown and Salem. Salem was a partial project because they ran out of funding so they only got partial funding for their project. Next slide. So this is something that I really want people to understand because a lot of people have asked the committee and we felt as a committee it was important for people to know what the timeline is and why we're moving forward. One reason we're moving forward is because building aid only comes up every every two years and it's 45 percent which is significant. The second reason is we are on a timeline that we have to follow. So July 1st is our deadline for abrams and, and question and answer periods to make sure all, all answers, all questions are answered and people have input. That would lead to a vote in March of 2023 and then in January of 2023 that list would come out and that list would list projects by priority. So if you're, you know, between one and five on the list you're likely to get funding. If you're anywhere below that, your chances are much lower, so that will give us a sense of where we stand. And the way you move up higher on the list is have a project that shows greater need. So then in March 2023, we would take a vote. The, the community would take a vote, committee talked about at length, was the fact that any, any project, this new school project would have to involve redistricting because it is very important to have manageable school sizes and not have one school that's much larger than the other. And that is something we've been dealing with historically, uneven class sizes. Next slide. So this slide is an overview of what Lavalley has been presenting for a while. These are not exact costs. These are order of magnitude costs. They are rough costs based on industry standards, which is 18, Dairy Village is 27, South Range is 26, West Running Brook is five, and Hood is 30. Next slide to those a number and present it in a slide that you can see. What you're seeing here is anything that got a score 50 or below was something that is something that needs attention. In places where there are multiple scores, that's because we've had a lot of schools that have had additions over time, so there's different parts of the building. So different parts of the building were assessed differently depending on their systems. I did not put, the, the school board voted in April that we were going to, we are going to close two schools and open one new one. And what you're looking here is comparing, DVS was the school that was chosen, one of the schools chosen to be closed and would be the proposed new school, the new site of a new school. It's an ideal location because one, it's in a central location, but also there's a lot of land behind it. So we can build a new school besides Dairy Village, keep the students at Dairy Village and not displace any students during construction. Dairy Village also, along with South Range, ranked highest for the number of needed repairs. So one thing about the repairs that people should keep in mind is if you walk through our schools, the floors are clean, the desks are in good repair, everything looks good and friendly and in shape, but there's things you can't see. You can't see HVAC systems, electrical systems, plumbing systems, exterior envelopes, which is how the outside of the, outside of the building and structural things. So comparing these two schools, you can see that these are the two smallest schools that would be considered to be combined with Dairy Village, that South Range has considerably more needs on some of these, on some of these items, exterior envelopes systems, than Grinnell does. 
and the, this is just one way that people can see what, and both of these buildings need roof replacements. Next slide. So people have been asking a lot about what size a new school would look like. So what this slide shows is if you redistributed students and built a new school that built a new school, you would have 383 students at South Granger Grinnell, whichever one remained, 88% capacity, 440 at East Derry. East Derry would not, Barca would have 551, and the new school board class size goals. It also used the data from, and Davis Demographics used the data from Derry about new buildings and development all the way up through last fall. Next slide. So a lot of people have been asking, what is the tax impact of a new school? For, this, for these next few slides, I'm going to pass it over to Jane. Jane is our business administrator, and she worked on these slides. OK. Um, as Erica mentioned, the um, school building aid process is now every two years. When we did the Gilbert H. Hood renovation and addition and the new school on Barca, uh, school building aid uh, you could apply for it every year at that time. So this is very new. It's um, been very recent that they changed the way they are, um, the whole application for school building aid. And what's different as well, many of you have seen that we receive school building aid each year in the budget. I place it in there as a, a revenue source. So the 45% of the payment uh, comes each and every year as an offset to your expenditures. The way they um, handle school building aid now is you would get, if you were to get your full 45%, so if we just go with 45%, you would um, receive your 45, 80% of your 45%, you would receive that up front. And you would receive the remaining 20% once the project is completed. And what that does by giving you your money up, by giving the building aid up front, the district would only have to bond a much smaller amount. So if we were to look at this, again, these are all just rough, very rough estimates. But for the purpose of this exercise, I just want to go through so everybody can understand how I came up with my calculations. So if we were to do a building project that was estimated at $65 million, and we were approved to receive 45% school building aid, um, that would be line A. We would also subtract out the cost for the deep wing that we were, um, that is part of the plan because uh, preschool programs ca are not eligible for school building aid, and we just did the estimate that the wing may cost $5 million. So we subtracted that out from the original cost of the building because that's not eligible. And so now you, in line C, you have the anticipated building aid is based on the project costs minus the deep wing uh, times 45%. So your Eligible school building aid would be approximately 27 million. And so if you were to take the entire project, your 65 million, subtract out the building aid, you now would only have to bond 38 million. So this is a little bit easier for if payments are going to look like. So the first, the first principal and interest, which will be the first uh, real year one, if we received 45% building aid, would be a total of three million. And in the uh, schedule of principal and interest, it's amortized. The rates go to the interest rate goes down each year, um, so your costs will go down every year. The estimated tax impact, if we were using the current assessed valuation number, the estimated tax impact in scenario number one, which is the 45% building aid, would be approximately 94 cents on the tax rate. Uh, I did calculate the estimated savings if a school were to close, which would be about $951,000, and that's an impact of $0.26 cent reduction on the tax rate. We'd also be saving on the Barca Hood bond, which is maturing, so we will not be having that payment. But remember, that payment is usually $1.2 million, but remember, we take in the 
school building aid as the offset in revenue. So the net between the principal and interest for the payment, last payment for Hood and Barca, less the amount of school building aid that we will we receive on that project nets out to be a savings for the district of 762,000 in that final year which would be a savings of 21 cents. So if you looked at your net impact on the tax rate would be estimated 47 cents. Again, that's if we received 45%. And you can follow the same process 30%. I'm not gonna redo the, the whole one. Just keep in mind right now, uh, they um, estimated that the rates are uh, five and a half percent. And this next slide, I had done the calculations which was only, I think, a day or two before we did that slide, and it was at 5%. So within two days, the estimation changed by a half percent interest additional. This chart is showing you if the district went ahead with the project, $65 million project, and we did not receive any school building aid, I just want you to see what the, the initial bond is, $65 million. By the time you are done paying for it, the total interest on that bond would be $50,365,750 with a $1.48 tax impact. Again, same methodology of using the current assessed valuation um, savings on the bond. So the total tax impact, if you did not receive school building aid, would be $1.01. Again, I, I always hate putting out tax impacts because assessed valuation change, these numbers will change when the project is uh, close to when we get the estimator in. So these are just to show what we have at this moment. Did you want me to do the next slide as well, Erica? Sure. Okay. Uh, the next slide I prepared, this is um, same methodology I used back in um, 2016, 2018, every time that we've brought forward or done a facilities plan, we've used the same methodology. Uh, we take the cost of any school or any size school that we think um, may close and one that uh, may open. So if we look at administration, secretary salaries and benefits, I list the cost and the savings. Now, in that particular line, if we were looking at opening a new building, um, there was conversation having one principal, two assistants, similar model to the middle schools. Um, again, these are just estimates. Um, general education teachers, that's going to vary based on the enrollment and the number of students. Same thing for special education. Uh, the nurse's salary, you would um, only need one nurse at this time. Over at the new school, guidance, same thing. You would uh, not be adding another guidance uh, person. Speech language, library assistance, these are all the positions that if we were looking at a new building, dependent on the size, some of those things may change. But as it stands now, um, again, the extracurricular stipends, you would not have to spend. Contracted services, you would still have because those people are going from school to school. They'd still be servicing those same children. Uh, custodial salaries, you would only need uh, because the custodians from one school would be going to the new building, but because of the size of the building, you would need one additional custodian, so that is reflected in the uh, net savings. Utilities, um, there is actually a, a fee in the building uh, while it's basically being mothballed until um, either the building is repurposed, sold, whatever the case may be. Would just be supplies really to maintain the building, um, but then you would see the cost savings there. Transportation, uh, I'm predicting that you're not gonna have any cost savings for transportation because um, you would still need those buses to transport the students, and again, there would be some redistricting involved, but um, that would not be a cost savings. Dues and fees for staff development, that would be a cost savings uh, because you, are, you would be eliminating some staff. So if you were to take a, an average school in our district uh, with a total cost to operate that school is approximately $5 million. <coughs> Thank you Jane, very can much. Can I ask a question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You can ask a question. Um, so in a larger school, we only need one guidance counselor? Is that... In one, well, I was getting to that, whoever said that. 
I don't agree with that. It, we're having a larger school. I think Barca has more than one guidance counselor. Do they not, or do they have a half shared or something? They, they have one and a half. And like I said, Brenda, these are just before we would have to meet with a, the, a full um, another committee to um, look at what do they meet um, state guidance of number of students for each of those positions. I'm just putting them in there because um, if, and, and I haven't looked at the state guidance, I just wanted to put together something that would show you estimated. We may not want to have an assistant, a second assistant principal, um, and you may need to have a part-time nurse. You may need to have a half-time guidance counselor, um, but we would think those things through, and, um, but I just wanted to show you what could be the savings. The but I agree, we would have to look again at numbers and see exactly which positions would move over. The other question I have about is about transportation. So we have in the three schools that we're talking about, everybody has walkers. If we're closing one, those kids aren't going to be able to walk. They're going to be too far away. So I would expect that transportation would increase somehow to make sure that everybody gets to school. Yes, and, and all of those are possibilities, but without um, doing the redistricting plan at this point, I, I wouldn't know. I took one school that currently has four buses, so, um, but yeah, I don't disagree with you, Brenda. You may have additional costs for busing, and we'd know that when we did redistricting. You, you also have costs that aren't accounted for yet that haven't been figured out, so it could be a wash, well, for all we know, until we figure it out. Right, it says varies. There's no numbers in there. I realize that, but I'm also thinking long term. What's going if this gets approved, what happens? Because that's what I need to do to feel comfortable with whatever's happening. And one guidance counselor is definitely not enough for that size school. It's not enough for Barca, I don't think. David, can you put up the last slide? So this last slide is just to sum up this presentation, what our next steps are. So tonight, we're going to have a discussion about choosing what schools to combine. And then our next agenda item is to discuss the Lavalley contract extension, because their initial contract was just for the facilities master plan. The next step would be to work with Lavalley to pick a cost estimate or create a plan to create the building aid proposal, which is due July 1st. In the summer, we would be developing a new school proposal along with a plan B. In the fall to the end of 2022, we would continue with the idea development. We would be holding community input sessions and continuing that work leading to January of 2023 when that priority list would come out. In March 2023, we would know where we stood. We, we would not know where we stood. So that is the end of the presentation as, I, as we reviewed in the first slide. Before the board discusses, I'm going to open it up to the public to either have questions or comments. Jay and Eric are here from the Valley. If you have questions for them, Jane is here for financial questions. I would just ask that, like any other public comment period, this public comment period is just for this presentation. I'd ask that you give your name and address and respond. I'll avoid the feedback. All right, Tracy Zisk, 5 Silver Street. Um, I just had one question on Erica. You had mentioned that the projections for the student number was based up until last fall. Uh, no, I apologize. I said that the projections for the numbers of students includes all of the building projects that have been going through Derry. Davis Demographics has been working with George Soros with the town. Okay, as of what date? They, we got that update at the end of last year. At uh, end of last year, okay. Because everything has changed a lot since last year and everything changed a lot as of last week. So from someone that has been going to those meetings faithfully, and I've never seen this consulting firm at any of those meetings, I can tell you as of last week, and you can confirm this with George, all the buffers were rearranged and taken back out, which anyone that understands construction is now you have your designated size lot without buffers, that means the builder can expand more. And that was the purpose, and that has happened in every single development in the West Running Brook District. Their, so their actual lot, buildable lot, is much bigger now. So when they could have put in a, 
boxed apartment of 66 units, they can now put in a boxed apartment with 66 units in 12 townhouses on one lot. Another lot may be able to put in a whole additional another apartment building. A lot has changed since last year. So as far as I'm concerned, any number that the school board has received is irrelevant. And I'm saying that wholeheartedly because I attend these meetings weekly. It's my neighborhood. I need to know what numbers are coming in. Um, and the numbers you were given were wrong. And you, it's simple as that. I, as of just last Tuesday, everything changed immensely. And I do appreciate that additional information. Yeah. And I just had one other quick question. It was Jane. Um, you, you had mentioned on the interest rate, it would go down each year. Does, does that cap off at a level? I'm sorry, Tracy. I, I, what I meant to say is the interest payment would go down. Down every year. Okay, interest you caught me on that. I was yeah. like, <laughs> the interest could be rate. On here. <laughs> yeah, the interest rate won't go down each year. Yeah. But and but we know that five percent or five and a half is high. It is. We got those. But I that's got those what rates. it is. Yeah, that's the reality. I right. mean, we all have to look at that. The you know. Right. The I got those from up. New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank, which is typically where most uh, municipal projects go to get bonding. Or you can do private bond citizens. Yeah. We've used them before. But right now, that's there. It's a high estimation, okay. but they do that purposefully so that. I just want to clarify on yes. that. Yes, thank you for. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Other people are welcome to come up. I just remind people to give their name and address for the record. Hello, Allison Strobel, 719 Route 121. Um, I appreciate, Erica, you providing the timeline for the facilities, um, the historical timeline. I do have a question, though. Um, I was part of the teachers um, visioning workshops, and I've been doing my best to follow along with the meetings um, from home and with the minutes online, but I was not able to find at what point things changed. Um, meeting 5, November 8, 2021, Grinnell was in a category of yellow along with um, Gilbert H. Hood. And then the red category was South Range, Dairy Village, SAU, and the maintenance building. That was pretty consistent through December, January, February. Um, in February 22nd, there were five options presented, none of which included selling Grinnell, only renovating. Um, again, in March, groups one, two, and three, Grinnell was part of group two. South Range and Dairy Village were group three. And um, South Range was specifically stated as the school to be closed when creating the new school. Uh, the facilities workshop on March 24th, same thing. Um, but then in April, things changed. But to oh. me, it's not apparent what. Oh, my apologies. So that, that was not included in this slide presentation. I apologize. So in April, we were reached out to by the town, and they expressed interest that Grinnell might be a property that they could use. And could we look at that as an option? Grinnell's conditions have not changed. It was just they were asked, we were asked at that time, would Grinnell considerably be an option? So for respect to the town, we, we, we brought, brought in both schools to look at what the options are. So the conditions of Grinnell have not changed at all. Right. It was just. So Grinnell is only in need of $16 million of renovations, yes. whereas South Range would that, be $29 million. That is million. the range of cost estimates provided okay. by, So yes. over $10 million more is South Range when Grinnell yes. is only 16. Okay, so I, as a part of the, the visioning workshop, um, it was staff members, community members, and a series of priorities were developed, um, some of which were considered community priorities. And um, I don't think those are measured in the scores when you look at the buildings. And I just wanted to bring that up. Um, the negative impact closing Grinnell would have on the school community in that neighborhood. Um, I've participated. We identified those points. And one is accessibility. Um, as you heard earlier, we have lots of clubs. We're hoping to get more going. Um, dismissal of those clubs, I see siblings coming to pick up their younger siblings, walking to school because parents are working. Um, what would happen to those kids' participation if we were to close Grinnell and not have that downtown school? Um, I know so I'm not trying to pit schools against other schools, but you know the demographics of Grinnell, if you look on iPlatform, um, the economically disadvantaged rate at our school is in the 40s and South Range is in the 20s. Um, so that's just kind of some of the inequities across the district, and I think 
um, that that should be considered when considering which school to close. Um, we're also looking to partner with the community. We're actually taking our students on a walking field trip to the library um, this week in fourth grade to give them access to those resources so that during the summers they can walk there. Um, I'd like to see Grinnell be improved and made more of a community resource so that kids can access maybe enrichment opportunities over the summer, different STEAM op opportunities. Um, so I just, I wouldn't feel right without bringing that to the attention of the board, so. Thank you. Are there other people from the public that have questions or comments? Hello. Uh, Jackie McPherson, 7 Sunset Ave. I have a couple questions. Um, you say you didn't want to make it into a super school, but you're taking schools that have average 300 plus students to doubling it. I would consider that a super school. Um, so do you know how many classes per grade in projected class sizes for the 618 students? The projected class sizes would not change. Those projections are based on our current school board policies and there would be five to six, five to six classes per grade. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, now I'm gonna talk my personal preference for South Range to stay open. Um, people like myself moved into South Range neighborhood for a school. I literally fought for that house because the South Range was right down the street. My road alone is turning around with new year, young families moving in early or moving out or passing on. Neighborhood kids bike to South Range every day to play soccer in the fields, use the basketball nets, play football, just to meet up with friends. They do this after school, weekends, all summer long. Who in the right mind is going to allow the children at that age to walk or ride their bikes on 28 to get to their new school to meet up with their friends? That will end, a nice safe place for these kids because I don't know what's gonna go there if South Range is closed. You're not only trying to remove a school, you're removing a community. This school is so much more to the families that are part of it. This, it's, I can't say anything about the economic value. We're at Grinnell versus South Range. I hate the fact that we're pitted against each other. I just kind of wish that it would all go away and our schools would stay the same. That's it. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Richard? Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't resist it. <laughs> Well, first off, oh, Richard Tripp, 44 Wyndham Road, just in case you don't know me. Uh, I like that you moved everybody f forward because now, even with the screens, I can see it better. So, you know, I appreciate you being nice to old people. Uh, Jane, you think that the, uh, the amount of money that's going to be uh, uh, allotted in uh, the next funding is going to be about... Uh, 48 million? Um, I'm not, you mean as far as how much the state will allocate yeah, to page projects five. for, for, for um, all projects? Um, I'm not sure. And I've been talking to Amy Clark from the Department of Ed who um, operates <coughs> a school, she yeah. manages a school building aid. Um, and they, do, they don't know. So that is, that is their maximum at this point. Yeah. And um, like Erica said, you know, we could get a ranking of so far and have other schools ahead of us and then their bonds don't pass. So it's, yeah. we don't, we really don't know how much, I, do I think that we'd get the full 45%? I don't well, that's, think that's so a, if there's the question a I lot of other, is, is, right. is this a best case scenario? It's a best case scenario. That you put forward, all yes. right, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's the one thing that I was wondering about because uh, if, if it's, uh, if the, if the uh, funding is split, then obviously, uh, well, first condition has to be met is dairy gets a high ranking. You know, second condition that has to be met is uh, dairy has to get the, the, the bulk of the funding. If you don't get the bulk of the funding, then your numbers uh, get higher. The, the, uh, the, uh, 
the tax numbers get higher. So uh, uh, that's why I tried to do um, best case, no case. <laughs> and so <laughs> you're going to see what the most tax impact yeah. based on all these numbers and what you <clears throat> would have if you got the 45 percent. So tax rate will be anywhere in between there based on how much we get. Yeah. Yep, and we did 30 percent. Yeah, we gave different scenarios. Yeah. So, uh, is there any anticipation that uh, uh, should dairy be ranked high, but the money split, that the uh, the school board will uh, cut back the amount of uh, uh, renovation that uh, is going to be done? So that's why. We have the ability to write the warrant to say that this project is dependent on getting building aid. It could literally be that there is no project without building aid. So you can you can word the warrant very specifically exactly how we will do that. We haven't done yet, but there's the ability to decide what you're going to do with the caveat of how much building aid you get. Well, I guess the question that I would have then is, have you prioritized uh, uh, which buildings get funding? We will work on that this summer. We will need to work on that oh, this, this summer. A, that's, that's part a, of Plan that's B. That's a TBD. That would that would be what the board would call Plan B. What do we do if? All right, Plan B. All right. Well, that's per that's perfect. Uh, well, I don't want to talk about anything else because we're only talking about this. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Kelly Zip, five and a half Silver Street. I do have a question, just looking at these numbers on the overview of the conditions of the school. On fire protection, where it says none for Grinnell, can you explain that? Grinnell does not have a sprinkler system, which, is, which has been, as my understanding, has been grandfathered in, but is required now. So they don't have one now, but you have to put one in eventually, or you're just waiting to see? If we renovated the building, we would have to put one in. But if you keep the school, if you keep Grinnell hypothetically, you, are you going to fix that? Or it just, could you, you say? We will be looking at a number of repairs, and that would be one of the ones we would be looking at. I would think that sprinklers would be important. I'm just throwing that out there. But OK, thank you. Just to, uh, to add to that, East Derry does not have a sprinkler system as well. And that's because they've been on a well up until this past fall. So Pam Sheedy of Two Muzzy Lake, uh, Jonathan and I have gone back and forth. Speaking the microphone, Sorry. Uh, Pam Sheedy of Two Muzzy Lane. I don't want to get too close. Other people have been real close. Um, Jonathan and I have had several conversations over the week, and I think I've shot many holes into this report. Just looking at two of your schools, right? How this company can grade one school fair, um, what was it, f uh, fair to good, and walk away with a 30 score and another school can be rated fair to poor and get a 50. And if you read the actual reports and you got into the meat of everything, you would see that they were identical. So the rankings, as far as I'm concerned, for those two schools, I've already kind of talked to him in depth about. We've already done the social uh, economical demographics of dairy when we built Barca, right? Any of you that have been around for that time, we opened Floyd. We put a lot of money into opening Floyd. We've done so many things in this town, okay? And it didn't fix it by opening Barker. We re if you remember, if any of you were in town back then, we redistrict, right? Because the concerns were, again, social, economical. Could we move them and get better education, right? I think we already dealt with that. So I really think many of the things I've talked to Jonathan about, even busing, right? We've talked about busing. Look at East Derry. The reason East Derry was, was built also was busing concerns, right? You had kids from the outer parts of town coming all the way in, so they built that school for, for the out part of the town. You would really be doing the same thing with, Derry, uh, with uh, Grinnell if you close South Range. You're going to bring kids from the far outside of town all the way in, right? So you're still going to have the same issues. And if we're making decisions on the social, economical demographics of towns, that may not be in the best interest of the whole town and all of the children in it, right? Because there's other kids to be considered. Where we live within the town should not make that decision for the school board, okay? 
I've been here for many, time, uh, many, many years, born and raised, and watched with the school board. Other members, some of you have been here forever, um, like Mr. Lutz, and uh, you've seen what the town has done, and you've seen the poor decisions that have come out of this. We put, I, I don't even remember the dollar amount into Floyd, reopening it. It was going to fix the world. We had, South Range had all the uh, trailers, if you will, attached, right, without even heating them. Then we did additions. Nothing has fixed this, nothing. And I don't want the town making decisions on social, economical. I don't, I don't think that's the right decision. So, thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who hasn't spoken yet that would like to ask any questions or make any comments before we move on to the board discussion at this time? If not, I thank everyone for their input and questions. There will be a second comment period, obviously, discussions and individuals at the end. There always is. Um, but for now, we are going to close the public comment period and open the floor to board having any questions for Jay or Eric or comments. Um, <clears throat> Brenda, what you mentioned about the, uh, about the guidance counselors, um, just to further sub substantiate any uh, support of that, um, the new school would have a projected population or capacity of 730, and the, for instance, is this school, West, uh, West Runningbrook has currently, as of uh, May 1st, according to the enrollment report, 592. West Runningbrook has three counselors. And um, I happen to, I, I know that when they had two and a half, they were operating on a shoestring. So um, I think that, you know, the, the, the number of counselors saying that you only have one, um, that's, I don't see that's a tenable uh, um, estimate of, of, of what the cost would be of a counselor. I don't see 730 students being served by one counselor. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the, the issues that, that I have with, with uh, the, that cost savings estimate. And that would bring you down to a, somewhere around three quarters of a million dollars or thereabouts. Oh, can I just quickly? Yeah, sure. Just to, just to note, I, I understand what you're saying about guidance counselors, and I agree with what you're saying. But just to note, it's, we're not, the intention is not to open with 730 students, but with 618. That's yeah. just the capacity of the school. Still, 592 at West Running Book with three. So I, um, I just think that that's worth, uh, worth uh, some consideration as far as that's concerned. Um, the, um, the only other uh, thing is that um, even if we build a new school, there are several schools that are remaining that are still in need of repairs. And those repairs are urgent. Um, I know that I wouldn't probably feel comfortable sending students into schools knowing that we had issues that were to the extent that they are. Um, I keep going back to the, um, the picture of, of the uh, glass screw-in fuses um, in an electrical system, which I think were phased out sometime in the 1940s or 50s. And um, to have something like that, because I don't even know what is revealed with inside the, that school in terms of wiring it goes. Um, if, that's, if they have screw and fuses, I don't know um, whether that's indicative of the rest of the system, the wiring systems in there. So that's just an example, though. Um, I think that um, you know, we have to also figure that besides whatever school that we close, we are still going to have to look at some allocation of funds to do some of the very urgent things in the schools that remain. And um, that's not a matter of being able to say, or not the reason to say that perhaps we shouldn't build a school, but I'm saying that those are other things we have to consider also. So that was my take on okay. the funding estimates. Just um, a 
clarification, minimum standards in New Hampshire for counseling, elementary five, uh, one per 500 students, and middle school is uh, one per 300. Um, but that said, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we can get enough counseling nowadays with the social emotional needs we have. But state, well, we know that. <laughs> but um, minimum standards, just so you know, is 500 for elementary and 300 for middle. Also, if I could point out, there is um, a full-time position at Barca and a half-time position at Barca. So the other half of that person goes to Dairy Village or Grinnell at this time. So you would still have that half-time position that you would have available to go over to the new school. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, I I have had a few conversations with some people in the public uh, this week or in the last couple weeks, I guess, since our last meeting, and I do hear and understand the concerns, um, like some of them we heard tonight, fire protection, um, the development in South Derry. Um, uh, Pam also did uh, want to point out to me as well that there was only $55,000 difference in the repair costs uh, of South Range and Grinnell. Um, also, we do at Grinnell, I'm sorry, at South Range, there are the NECC classrooms um, that obviously if we were to close, um, we would have to find something, which we again are including in the new school development. Um, uh, some of the concerns I heard tonight uh, that I would, I would say, I mean, we need to address, right? We need to become more operationally efficient. Um, we are stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place as far as like, you look at all these schools, and again, we have a lot of issues, and those issues are not going away. Um, I, I, I do not think we can afford to do this without school building aid. Um, I think, uh, so, I mean, we've already made that decision. Um, I do trust the work that Lavely Brensinger has done uh, in the meetings that we've had. They've proved to us time and time again that they have a, a really good handle. Um, they communicate well with Jane, uh, Austin, Marianne, the rest of the administration, um, and worked with like Jeremy to get a really great report. Um, and it is tough to go through and read and, and see all these things and see the state of our buildings that, you know, we have, we have, there's a lot of money that it would take to fix these things. And we're not going to get all that money. Um, but again, I, I've said it all along. Um, we need to be financially prudent. Uh, we have an opportunity that's not guaranteed, um, but I think we have the ability to write the Warren article the way it is. Um, I guess I know, I know this conversation is more going to be about which school we think um, is best. Uh, I've I've had conversations. Uh, I have not. I personally have not been swayed that South Range um, should not be the school uh, that we would we would propose to close. Um, so I would prefer to keep uh, Grinnell. I do not, I, I, I cringe when I hear things that we are pitting schools against each other. Um, I, I don't think we are. I think we are trying to take as objective an approach as possible in doing this. Um, and I think that I, it, w when you look at the exterior envelope and the major repairs that would need to be there, um, if we we're left with keeping South Range, there is far greater um, concerns about the exterior envelope. Uh, and I know, again, there's no fire protection at Grinnell, but again, that's something that we can address um, or we would have the ability to address. So again, I do look at this as ob trying to be as objective as possible. Um, there are a lot of variables that come into play, transportation, uh, like I said, the NECC classrooms. Um, it is not just one, hey, you know, this is it, but um, I think it was Allison that discussed the about eight million or ten million dollars that it would cost in renovations for, um, or more it would cost in renovations for South Range. I don't think we could be left with having the ability to to put eight more million dollars. Um, and some of the conversations I've had, I I've had community members tell me that 
they think it's worth it to keep South Range for $8 million. Um, I don't think I don't think any of us could sit here and answer to the rest of the community to say, well, you know, we decided to keep this because, you know, it's better for our South Range and it's going to cost $8 million more. So um, I know it's tough. We have to make a decision. Um, those are my thoughts. Um, yeah, and I, I think all of us are, all have a tough decision to make or we have a tough vote to make tonight. Um, and yeah, those are, yeah, that's just really my thoughts, I guess. So that's kind of what it boils down for me at the end of the day when you when you look at the facilities report when you look at this presentation tonight it's hard to justify closing Grinnell when there's eight million dollar difference in cost to renovate um, and and you know we were voted to 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 take care of all the kids in Derry and and I and I, my heart does go out to South Range it does <laughs> it does I mean that's when it comes down to it it's 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 what we can afford to do and and what the best route is for this town to go so that's kind of where i'm at with that it's like a showdown who's going to speak after brenda brenda's going to speak i still stand where i did last week or two weeks ago i've gone through the reports again for the three schools that are in question right now. I visited. Um, I found more errors. Um, one of them is pretty big because it's the furnace at Grinnell. What's written in this report is wrong. They have a new furnace. They do not have a McQuay furnace at all there. That just makes me wonder, and I'm not trained to do this. I'm doing my darndest to, po to figure out what's right. But if me not being trained are pulling out those important pieces. I don't know what else has been repaired since the, this report was done. Like I said last, the last time, I think this is a really valuable report for Jeremy, for the purpose that we asked it to be done. It's very valuable. But I also know things have been done since he got the report, or be, even before he got it. We were still making upgrades, making corrections, and I don't know all of those things. But just knowing the, the difference between the two schools and the things that I've pulled out, I'm not comfortable making a decision, and I don't think any of you should be either, especially when you have a furnace that's marked as, I don't remember the number, but it's not even there. So I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that. I still stand where I did last, the last meeting. Um, I. Fire, we need to upgrade the fire systems wherever they need to be upgraded, and that doesn't only mean the two schools that don't have sprinklers. We need to fix roofs. Um, I don't agree that Barca doesn't have a problem. They have a waterfall that runs down their gym wall when it rains. That's a problem. That's a lot of water, and who knows what it's ruining when it goes into the, into the concrete. I also think those are substantial um, renovations. I don't I don't work for the DOE, I don't know all their rules, but I did talk to somebody who said substantial is not carpets, but it could be other things. I don't know what those other things are. I actually tried to reach out to the commissioner today and I didn't reach him. So um, I stand, stand there. I do think that we've pitted people against each other. I've talked to some people who received phone calls from board members that were really disturbing to me. I don't appreciate that people do that and try to pit each other against each other just to get a reason to close one school or another. Um, made me really sad, actually, when I heard that. So I stand where I stand. I will not support a new school. So I take exception to that when you mention that, because if people have concerns, I prefer to talk to them. Talk to them. If someone calls somebody in this community and says, why should I close one school over another, that is not correct. If they have concerns, 100% they should share them with everybody or whoever they're comfortable with. But the things that I heard, I'm not comfortable with. And I think whoever, I don't know who did it, but whoever did it should be ashamed. So I think we should refocus this conversation on people's individual thoughts on this plan and project and not on talking at each other, but hopefully talking with each other so we can discuss our differences and where we each feel and come to a conclusion to be as respectful as possible.
I guess I would just, a couple of people this evening have brought up errors in the report and obviously after looking at charts and pages of text of a thousand page report, I don't remember where I may have seen questionable items, but since we have LaValley here, could you address some of those questions about the errors in the reports? Could you come to the table? Thank you for having us here tonight. I'm Jay Doherty, and this is Eric LeBlanc. And um, the, the errors of the reports, um, we have combed through the reports the best that we could. We did hire a whole team of engineers. These aren't just our comments. These are um, a whole team of engineers that have gone through the building. Um, we have tried to make sure we get everything correct. And as Brent, as you pointed out, the, the point of this original document was last summer for us to go through so that we build a, a um, something for the facilities team to understand what's wrong with the buildings. Um, I will definitely check the, the error you just mentioned. Um, I did, we did notice the typo you did point out last time that the basketball hoops in the gym versus the cafeteria, and that was a, a small typo, but you're absolutely right, that was wrong. Um, we will check into the boiler and see when that was replaced to see why the engineers put the other boiler in there. Um, but we have tried to comb through um, our engineers' documents the best we can to make sure everything is as accurate as possible. There's, we are in no way trying to um, say something's um, beyond its life that it's not. We're, we're really trying to give you an honest report that Jeremy and the facilities team can use in the future to figure out what's wrong with the buildings and what needs to be fixed. So I'm, I'm sorry about that error, and we will continue to look through our report to make sure there are no other errors. And, and I'll just add, too, that I know that there have been some upgrades, too, for, um, for some of the building systems, um, specifically the the water system at East Derry. So I know, I know some of the things have changed even in the past couple months since the report has come out. So um, just wanted to add that as well. I know a lot of things have been updated or changed or corrected, but I think for making this kind of a decision, and this isn't actually on you, this is on the facilities committee for the board. I think that we should have had a list of things. I, you know, I try to keep up with what Jeremy does. I try to go to visit the schools. Um, I volunteer not most of them um, now that we can. I think that there should be a, a report or a list or something for us to put back to each one of these. So whatever was done in South Range, I should have a list of, and not from you, like I said, but. And you should have received it as well, right? We did this to South Range. We've, we've upgraded flooring. We've, um, and the other piece that does bother me about the whole report, th there's, there is one thing that I'm not going to talk about, but there is some, we upgraded every single entry to our buildings with um, Jane and Homeland Security. They, I don't know what else we could do to upgrade those. They're, they're all upgraded. It was a lot of money that we got to do it. It was a lot of work. Um, so that's all been do done too, and I don't think that that got the proper recognition that it should have in the reports. But I, you know, I, in fairness to you, there have been things that have been have been corrected, have been updated, and that should have been also included with these reports, not by you, but by the facilities people on, on the school board committee. That's just my opinion. And while I'm talking about this, I think that. The school board facilities committee should not be meeting by themselves anymore. There's so many things going on. They happen the same day as a board meeting. I think the meeting should be happening here. The information, <coughs> the information should be coming to a board meeting as an agenda item. Uh, Jane or Austin, um, so I know the report that we posted um, has not been updated on the website. However, I was under the impression that this would be a living, breathing document that Jeremy would continue to update. So even though it's not on the website, is this something that you guys can say um, has continued to be updated uh, and so that we are keeping accurate records of when we do in, uh, uh, install new systems? Like, I, I mean, you may even thinking of the new dishwasher that went in at East Area. Are we keeping track and records of these this information? Uh, Jeremy would be keeping track of that information, yes. Thank you. Um, and the other thing is, Jane, um, I know we talked about this this morning. Um, we actually, uh, Brenda, we, we agree that 
um, that we are changing the dates of the uh, fac facilities committee assignment or committee meetings to be on off weeks of the uh, school board meetings um, starting next week as well. Well, that wasn't my suggestion. My suggestion was that it comes to the board as an agenda item each board meeting if you're meeting. Too many things are happening. Let's do it. Do it. Add it to the agenda. For folks that haven't spoken up on the board, do people have? As, as far as um, as far as the um, n n not you gentlemen, but uh, for our own um, <clears throat> thoughts, um, <clears throat> I'm a pragmatist, and I, I I think that I always say that I hope for the best, but I always plan for the worst. And um, <clears throat> in in looking into the um, the crystal ball that I don't have. Um, I am not optimistic about getting funding for a school. Um, for what reason? A host of reasons, a myriad of reasons, all of which may not be valid. Um, but I know that um, if <clears throat> any of you who play the lottery walk into a store and purchase a ticket, I don't. I keep that dollar in my pocket. But um, if you do that, you all are aware of the fact that you could be the person that wins the, wins the big bucks. Um, and that's what we're hoping for here, although our odds are much better than buying a lottery ticket. But um, we have people who make decisions um, about where that money goes, to whom it goes, how much of it goes to different places or different districts, for what purposes. Um, and um, we cast our hopes on the water and hope that that uh, it's returned many-fold um, in, f in, the f in the form of uh, funding for us. I think that, keeping this in mind, I think what's more, I don't think it's very really um, as meaningful about is choosing what school we should close or what school we should open, uh, clo uh, remain open, um, as much as <clears throat> putting a lot of thought into what we've been identifying as Plan B. Um, because that's the reality, I think, that we have to plan for. As I said, we hope for the best, and we hope we get the money, but we have to plan for the worst. And I think that um, putting a lot of thought into that Plan B and knowing the reality is that we are going to have to probably fund a lot of that out of our pocket, and we also are going to have to um, do the things that we're going to have to prioritize and do the things that are cost effective and vital. I think those are the uh, questions that we have to ask ourselves and, and be very, very um, analytic about and, um, and, and come up with a, a good, viable plan. The only other thing I'm going to say as far as the people from Grinnell and the people from South Range that are here that have voiced their opinions. Um, I, I view myself uh, as a board member as a custodian of the school district and of the education of the students, but, but I also view myself as a person who is there to represent the views of people in the community. So I have to listen to you. And um, I will say that when it comes down to deciding what we do with what school, when and where, um, you know, we have to look at the money. We have to look at the future. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the considerations are the things that you're talking about. One of the considerations that we have to, we have to uh, include is the things that you're talking about as far as the quality of your neighborhoods go and things like that. Now, having said that, those things may not override the entire issue. I don't know. But they are considered. And I think that it's important that we take them into consideration along with everything else. I would venture to guess that people probably don't want to pay 
a whole lot more money on their homes in terms of property taxes um, just to keep a school open and then have to sell their house because they can't afford the property taxes. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And I know that's an extreme example. But that's my point is that we have to, we have to strike these balances. And I think that to go with just the emotional thing as far as keeping a specific school is wrong, but also it's wrong to just take and be the bean counter and not consider your input. So I think it's important that we do that. So it, I, I just want to remind every, like really the board members, so we, we can't have a plan B until we have a plan A. Um, so that, like, we don't have a plan A right now, right? We, but we have all, but we have as a board decided in a previous vote that we think that the best plan moving forward is to build a new school. Now, that's not everyone on the board. That's, that's at, at the end of the night, right, we have a decision to make that we have to put on the school building aid that, again, and, and what we think is going to put our best application forward in hopes that we do get the money that we can, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, we do have to make a decision of, uh, all right, we know it's, we have, we have already said Dairy Village, and it is either Grinnell or South Range. And again, I, I can't say this enough, it is a tough decision for all of us that we have to make, but I mean, that is what the discussion is that we are having right now should be about, is we, we need to get, get a plan A, and then once we get a plan A, we can work on plan B, and then we take the summer, the fall, the winter, and yeah, we all have to bus our behinds to make sure that we are in front of the in front of the community and that we are saying, hey, you know what? This is the potential tax impacts. This is the potential socioeconomic impacts. This is the potential impacts on South Range, uh, or sorry, South Dairy. This is the potential impacts potentially on Grinnell District. This is the potential impacts on Dairy Village. So yes, there is a tough road to hoe, um, but I am maybe too, maybe a little bit too much, but I'm confident that if we put together a well-structured plan A and a well-structured plan B, that we have the ability to execute on one of those. Um, and I hope that we do have buy-in. And I know there's a lot of naysayers out there. Um, I'm asking those naysayers to continue to reach out and continue to have conversations. And I know I'm not always going to agree with you and you're not always going to agree with me, um, but I think if we continue to keep in mind that we are trying to do what's best for the entire community in the district, we'll figure it out. Um, and so, I, again, these aren't always easy discussions. These aren't always easy decisions to make. But I do, I just want to remind everyone that we've already, we've already voted on the decision to move forward with the new school and to, to demolish Dairy Village. The decision tonight really does come down to, Dairy, uh, to South Range and Grinnell and what we're going to put on the building application. So can we go back to that night and that vote because I wish I brought that packet with me. I believe that the, it wasn't a motion, it was just stated. It, did, it didn't say that it was a motion. Does it, Tammy, do you have that? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, we did vote. It may be a technicality, I don't know, but when I read them over, it says Jonathan Dugan stated. It doesn't say he made a motion, and I don't know that that matters. I'm just making a point so that it, it does matter, it gets corrected. The marvels of modern technology, we can look it up. I think I'm the one that made the motion, so. We'll double check. And while you're doing that, what happened to the plan to make a plan to also apply for aid for renovations? Discussion, as I recall, was to break it up into pieces. So the building aid that's being applied for is for what? Right now, we're discussing a new school. So the plan has to be go to the, the state by July 1, right? Yes. 
So why, if, if there's a plan to build a new school, that's pretty, you know what that is. It's a school and there's a dollar amount, I believe it was 80 something million. 65 million. I don't think that was what was in the motion, but whatever. Um, or that's the- There was no dollar amount, because I was told not to. There was definitely a dollar amount discussed and it was 80 plus. Whether it got put in the motion or not, I don't know, but it was discussed. So, and all I know is what comes out of facilities. I don't, I don't know if 65 is right, I don't know if 80 is right. It doesn't matter at this point what's right because it has to be figured out. But if we're making a plan to build a new school and apply for aid, why aren't we making another plan at the same time for the important renovations that need to be done and make the case for the importance of those as well? We as a board decided in, in April that the mo our, our first plan to move forward with was a new school building. So I'd like to refocus the discussion on that and we can certainly have a larger discussion. But I would like to say a few things while Austin's looking that up. Um, <coughs> I've been on this board for six years now and when there's been, for years, people have been telling us, close the school, that's all your enrollments are dropping. Well, we can't do that anymore because our elementary enrollments have remained stable. They haven't gone up, they haven't really, they've gone down a tiny bit, but overall they've remained stable. Our, our charge as a board is to chart a path forward that's the best educationally and financially for all students, staff, and the community at large. That's a lot of interests that intersect with each other and frankly compete with each other. But one thing I know, I could not be on the board if I wasn't an optimist and if I wasn't a pragmatist because the optimist side of me has to believe we can do the best with the money we have and the, pra the pragmatist side has to believe we can do it the best way possible respecting every dollar that you give to us. So I am, I am certain that enrollments will change as this process goes on, but I also know from looking at the numbers that our buildings are not equally balanced and our buildings are not at capacity, even based on our current enrollments, based on our, the class sizes we vote on. Our aim is to provide the best education for all students. To do that, we need to provide equity. We need to provide all the opportunities that can be given. And the challenge we have right now is we have five neighborhood schools, and we do have five neighborhood schools. Every elementary school is a neighborhood school. And it is getting hard to balance the class sizes and the needs of all those five schools. A new school may not be ideal, but a new bigger school allows us to save some costs, but incur other costs. It also allows us to address issues of equity and it allows us to make some slightly better financial decisions. This is not about one school against another in my mind. It's trying to balance what we need so that in, in 20 years when this is said and done, we don't fix a number of schools and then those schools need to be fixed again. If we build a new school and we build it at the right size with space to grow if need be, in 20 years we have a new school that's in good shape and can still serve students and was an investment that is paying dividends and will continue to pay dividends. For that reason, I do support building a new school. The reason the reason that I would choose South Range over Grinnell to be part of that new school is not because of anything social, emotional, or the different school. It's simply that the most expensive things to fix, the biggest ones represented to us was the building envelope, which is an idea that, which is something identified by, by La Valley, Derry Village and South Range are sister schools. They were built around the same time and have a lot of the same challenges and the really expensive ones are the building envelope issues. So I look at that and say, how can I responsibly go to taxpayers and not just look at what we need? Because every school is a neighborhood school. Every child ideally deserves a neighborhood school, but every child also deserves the best education possible. And we don't always have money to provide every child with exactly what we need. We have to look at the whole community and make the best decision we can. People will disagree with me, but I listen to everyone that emails me. I listen to everything that's being said but just sometimes we don't always agree on what the best path forward is. But remember, every single member of this community will be able to vote next March on whether they agree or not. So um, I think what you're talking about, Brenda, it was April 12th, actually. April 7th was the public forum, so I've got uh, there was uh, a public comment first, and there was a great deal of that, and then there was board conversations. 
Jonathan Duggan made a motion to build a new school to fix the roofs and then prioritize the remaining repairs that need to be done in the district and to close two schools to build a school. Erica Cohen seconded the motion. Mr. Anderson amended the motion to include closing or selling the superintendent's building and building a new maintenance and superintendent building. Mr. Duggan stated they would build a new school, redo the roofs in the remaining buildings, prioritize the repairs, close two schools, sell the superintendent's building, build a new maintenance SAU building. David Clapp seconded this amended motion roll call vote, which we know was um, six to one. Derek Anderson made a motion to pursue the next phase contract with the Valley, and that was a seven, uh, David Clapp second in the motion, and that was a 7 0. Oh. Have other board, do other board members who have not spoken yet have thought, have, does anyone else have anything to say or would like to make a motion? I, the only thing, I, it's so um, this is something that actually I thought about recently as well, actually discussions with Pam um, yesterday, maybe the other day, is, uh, is um, again, is going back and looking at that and, as, or looking at the new maintenance in SAU building, um, just because of, again, uh, the five to seven or eight million dollars that that would be, I, I do not, th I, now, knowing that what the school building aid is and all that stuff, I think we maybe need to rethink that um, because I think that, I get, again, looking at the rising interest rates, looking at the rising costs of construction, things like that, I think that is something else to consider um, not including in that. And so that would unfortunately um, probably result in, again, not a great facility um, for the maintenance building. I still think selling the SAU is probably the, the right thing to do there. And I know the administration um, would probably not be happy, um, but finding space for them to be somewhere else, whether that is at Hood. I know that was a plan that we talked about, um, but I think that's more part of a plan B. Um, so again, the priority for me would today would be to figure out what to do with the new, or what, how we get the school building application completed um, on time, which would really be new school and um, the decision to close two schools. Would anyone like to make a motion at this time? I, I guess I will make a motion. So I'm <laughs> uh, a motion to continue, or like, I guess, I, I get, I'm not great at wording these things. So <laughs> uh, a motion to, uh, close, I guess, Dairy Village and South Range uh, so that we can move forward with the school building aid application um, and put those two schools in there. Um, I don't know if, I guess that's the motion I would make. Jane, does that sound right to you for a motion? Yes, can you just repeat it one more time? Yeah, Sorry. motion to uh, close Dairy Village and South Range School um, so that we can move forward with the school building application. Correct. And is there a second for that motion? Second. I guess the only discussion I would have is, do we need to restate, should, should the motion include the entire plan, I guess? So we're gonna close DVS and South Range, build a new school. Do we also want a word in that to remove the maintenance SAU? If the maintenance and SAU is eligible for building aid, I would think we'd want to leave it in to make it more interesting a project for the state to to prioritize. But if we if that's not eligible because it's not educational space directly educational space anyway, um, then we could remove it. I think it might be valuable to put in prioritizing some other repairs, but I think putting in the maintenance and SAU could get complicated. Just don't, or if other repairs we've talked about are roofs, which aren't eligible, so we couldn't put that in. So are there other things that, the other schools that are eligible that we'd want to make sure are in the plan? We could put forward a number, an estimated number.
John, it was your emotion. Do you what 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 are your thoughts? Um, I, yeah. I, again, my thought is to not include the SAU and maintenance building, a new SAU and maintenance building as part of the new build, new school building aid, um, because I f don't know if that would actually help us. That's my assumption, or that's my not my assumption. That is my general feeling towards that. Does this motion need to specify that this is specifically for the proposal for building aid? Yes. Because yes, that's a good point. Yeah, if it doesn't go through, if we don't get building aid, we're not close. You know, that's yeah. not moving right. forward. That is not part of this. So I think the motion should. What we need right now is a motion, so that in that proposal, these are the two schools that are closing and building a new school. Yeah, for I thought, the building aid application. Yeah, I thought I, I I thought I said that, but I will I will restate I will restate the motion. So the motion is to close or include in the new school building aid application that we will that should we get school building aid we will the plan is to close south range and dairy village i think you should probably restate that to say i make a motion to close south range and dairy village to open a new school and that this is what we will be putting forth for the application for building aid so moved. I'm going to take a roll call vote. Brenda? John? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Paul? No. Derek? Yes. David? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Motion passes. So is there any other discussion we'd like to have at this time on this topic? Erica, I just, I, I'm on my building aid um, outline and SAU offices are not eligible for school building aid. It doesn't mention warehouses, but just so you know. So I would, I would, I know it wasn't part of this motion, so we sh shouldn't have to change it. We did vote previously, um, but since it wasn't part of this motion, I think we're okay about and not going back and taking it out. So I think we're okay there. Is there anything else anyone would like to discuss on this topic before we move to the next agenda item, which is the lavalley Brensinger contract extension? I just, Paul. I just, I just was uh, uh, just a point of clarification about the um, SAU uh, building. Um, and John mentioned moving it into one of the other schools, uh, dividing the uh, responsibilities up or anything. Do we have um, sufficient, do we know if we have sufficient um, square footage and offices to do that, um, that I, type of plan? I think we'd have to, that'd be part of plan B to. Yeah, I mean. I think the only problem is that, that we're gonna prioritize the things that really need to be done at other schools because we're not gonna have a whole lot of money left over at the end of the day. And oh. I doubt that that's gonna be part of any discussion at that point. Yeah, so I mean, I'm just thinking about, it's a good idea to do to do that um, because of the dire situation that the SAU was in, but um, if we if we uh, take that construction out with the intention of moving it to another school or another building, and we find that we don't have the room to do it, that's not necessarily a, it's a good plan, but the implementation isn't particularly <laughs> good. So, but uh, I just wanted to mention that as a just a thought. Thank you. Is there anything else on this topic? If not, we will move on to the Lavalley Brensinger contract extension, and I would invite Jay and Eric to come up in case there are questions to be answered. Jane, can you introduce this? Sure. Um, we'll be presenting tonight an amendment to the original agreement that we had between Lavalley uh, Brenziger Architects for the remaining project. So it would be um, any of the work that they've done since the end of the last contract uh, through completion of um, the application of school building aid. And um, both Jay and Erica here tonight to discuss the contract and any questions you may have uh, with the contract. 
board members received this in their packet last week. Do people have questions before we discuss voting on the contract? Jay and Eric are here to answer any of those questions or questions for Jane. So for the benefit of the public, just to give the back, the Lavallee Brensinger was hired last spring to conduct a facilities, a facilities master plan, and that took them through March, or through really around March, when they finished, when they finished, they created the master plan, which included the 1,000 page, page report and the draft of a potential school pro project, and then once it, they hit that point, that's when we were in kind of a gray period transitioning because that finished the master plan proposal and the next step would be applying for building aid and that requires a contract extension. So for the benefit of the public, that's just where we are right now historically and what the board is looking at. And this was posted online along with, I should let people know if they wanna look, a list of all the major projects needed by school and the proposal itself. So at this point, if any members of the board have questions about the contract, now would be either of Jane or Jay and Eric, they would be happy to answer them. I would just ask Jay and Eric, if you don't mind just kind of walking us through it and kind of talk about how you came about with some of the figures throughout the different sections of the contract. Definitely, I apologize. Let me just run to my seat and get a copy because I don't, I don't have So we broke it down into four parts to, so you can understand where the, the costs are. The first part is um, really the design of the new school. Um, we've been working with the committee to come up with the program, the spaces that are needed, uh, basically a, a design so we can figure out um, what the school's gonna look like, how big it's gonna be, everything that the estimator's gonna need, which include um, an outline of structural systems, outline of mechanical systems, all the systems that go into that building. So that'll be a package that, that we'll talk about what this school is. The second part is to have the estimator on board. That's a company that will join us that can actually estimate things. Everything we've given you so far is order of magnitude based on what the industry standards are. This person has a much better knowledge of what the market is doing right now. So that's the estimator will be part of our team to estimate the project. And that those are two of the requirements we need if we're gonna go forward with the building aid. The next part is actually the application. And I tried to break it down as best as I could of all the parts that go into this. This is um, the tasks that are included in the application. If anyone's seen the application forms, there are 18 different parts. They, it's a checklist basically to make sure we hit all these pieces. Um, I won't go through all of them, but what I try to do is list the title of what the form is they need, um, whose responsibility it is, if it's LBA, that's us, or if it's the SAU, and how we'll assist you in making sure we get all those forms in line the best we can. Um, a lot of this has to do with the assessment report. We already did part of the master plan, so it's pulling through all the data to make sure we can develop a package that, that ties to this. I'm happy to go through any of those 18 steps or all of the 18 steps if you really want me to. Would the board like me to go through any? Does anyone have any specific questions about any of those steps? I just have one, just as I'm starting to read down through number three, it says a copy of the 20 year maintenance plan. I, I think we've done pretty good at maybe a five, maybe Jeremy has a 10 year, but do we have to now come up with a 20 year maintenance plan? Yes, and we can help you because okay. we've, we've worked with other districts to have that, so we have almost a template that can help you um, develop that 20 year plan, yeah. Um, again, if there's any other questions on those, happy to dig into them. The last part is just meetings. Um, we're, we're been working with the, the, um, the subcommittee on bi-weekly meetings and we've been coming here at bi-weekly meetings. Um, our first um, contract had, we figured about 11 meetings. We ended up spending, um, I counted them earlier, um, up until now, 23 meetings. Um, so we've spent more meetings than we typically do. Um, but for us to be here, um, typically it's not just us here, especially at the, the subcommittee meetings we're presenting. We have um, 
a long period of putting presentations together, making sure we have all the data for those, and then after those, uh, follow-up questions from email or phone calls or whatever happens after that. So that's just time for those extra meetings in there. So that's the four parts that we put together for this, and I'm happy to talk about any piece in particular or, or as I said, dive through any of those 18 um, pieces that we need. The building aid application is solely for a new school, correct? Correct. So based on um, what was read, they, the, the charge to us was for a new school. Thank you. And this new contract would go through July 1st? Correct. The application for building it. Yep. So we'd have the application into the state with all the pieces that tie to that and um, all the pieces that are listed here. Yes. Yep. What kind of time frame or hours wise are you guys working on the, con the application? Roughly, um, roughly. You don't have to. I mean. Good question. I broke each one's broken down individually for how much time we think we'd spend. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, some of these are tied to, if you see some are civil engineers, there's some time for them to be in here. Um, it, is, it is very intensive. It, it will take us um, quite a bit of time to put all these documents together. And obviously we want to do the best we possibly can to get you as high a ranking as we can. So um, I don't know the exact number, but it is very intensive. Uh, I hope this answer is positive, but uh, do you have any concerns about meeting the July 1st deadline? I don't. We've, we've been moving at a very good clip. Um, I think the last time we were here, we were starting with some really simple bi bubble diagrams. Um, we've been progressing to get to that level that we're going to need for the, the state. Um, and I feel very confident that we can keep on moving. Um, there are some pieces I will note in here, and I just want to point out that we will need some help from some outside organizations here in your, your town, um, uh, such as the fire department and the health inspector. Um, so. I'm, I'm sure they'll be happy to help us um, for these parts to help us meet that deadline. But there are a couple outside pieces that are beyond our control that we'll work, we'll work with them on. Um, I mean, I, I don't really have any other questions. Um, I, in my professional experience I do sell construction software um, this does pr seem pretty boilerplate um, I know that uh, in talking with different project managers project engineers um, architects uh, design firms things like that that um, again these are things that that this is what they do they design buildings they estimate them they bid on them um, I that's just kind of just wanted to give that um, kind of Mindset is that this is all pretty standard um, and nothing is kind of sticking out to me. Um, and for anyone that wants to know, I've been at Bluebeam as a enterprise account executive for the last four years um, and we help organizations um, really just plan out buildings and projects and um, construction has been um, I don't know. They they've streamlined these, these efficient or they've they've created efficiencies and streamlined processes that um, they're very efficient. So I'm sure you guys have many projects that you guys are working on. Um, so that's just my yeah. That's it. So I'll make a motion to approve amendment number one to the agreement between Dairy Cooperative School District and the Valley Brensinger Professional Association. I'll second. A first by Derek and a second by Jessica. I'm going to do a roll call vote again. Brenda? John? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Paul? Yes. David? Yes. Derek? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank you very much. And we, we appreciate you being here tonight well, and thank your you continued for, thank work. Thank you for having us again. Thank you. If you have any more questions, we're, we'll be around for a little bit, or we can take off if you think you're all set uh, with you, us. You can head out. We're, this is the last agenda item that applies to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Our next item on the agenda is the superintendent's update. Dr. Con Dr. 
Connors Krikorian did share that with Dr. Garofalo and, Oops. sorry, I skipped an item. Policy is the next agenda item. Dr. Garofalo. So for uh, sake of brevity, these are all second readings, so I'll read through them. Uh, quickly, BDFA, Fiscal Advisory Committee, EBCA, Crisis Prevention and Emergency Response Plans, JLCJA, JA, Sports Injury Emergency Action Plan, EBBB, Accident Reports, JLCF, Wellness, and EEAG, Use of Private, v private Vehicles to Transport Students, all second readings. Any questions? Uh, I, I, I do. I, I didn't realize this till after the meeting um, a couple weeks ago. Um, I think I just misread, misread it the first time. Uh, this is in regards to the BDFA, the Fiscal Advisory Committee. So um, I know when I was on the Policy Committee last year, uh, prior to uh, being moved off of it, uh, I was reached out about potentially voting on members um, to be that. So I do see that we've continued to be first come first serve basis. Um, I just, I guess, question for the policy committee, kind of what is the thought process behind that? Um, was there any discussion um, around potentially voting or, um, I don't know, yeah, just kind of what your thought processes were? Yeah, there was. We, we discussed this, I forget what date it was, it was last month. I brought it up in the policy committee as a, a gender item. Um, you know, based on feedback we heard, I've heard, we all heard that feedback, um, and it was determined at the time that we would not go forth with that, with that um, option. The compromise was we would add two alternates to expand the field, and and just, you know, my my thought process for an alternate is they they go to the meeting, they're required to go to the meeting, they can ask questions, they just can't take part in the discussion. And when you do have an absentee, they can slide right in and, and, and be part of the discussion. And if somebody does drop off, they just slide right in. They're, their first priority is to slide right into the position. So it's not, it's a compromise. It's not perfect, but it does expand the field and it does allow more people to get involved. And you know that's kind of where we were at with that. And that's kind of how it sh shook out in the meeting. Okay, perfect. Yeah, just I, like I said, I just wanted to know. Um, I think, again, I, it's important that we point out that the Fiscal Advisory Committee, again, we have a, we, we're the ones that decide. Uh, we certainly work collaboratively and um, really appreciate everyone that does volunteer to do that. Um, and even if, you, even if you do apply and you're not, unfortunately, first come, first serve, or even one of the two alternates, I would say that doesn't prevent you from participating either. Um, so continue to reach out with questions that you do have um, during the budgeting cycle and um, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out. I know fiscal advisory committee members. Um, I don't know if they love love getting questions, but they they take right. They they they. In, uh, I think they enjoy the process of going through that um, and then working with the the board to um, come up with a budget. So, Jean, appreciate cor that. correct me if I'm wrong, but we, with the exception of last year when we added an alt when we added one more in, have we ever had more people interested than spots? Typically not. Okay. In fact, um, I, sent, I was going to bring it in my report, but since you um, brought it up, uh, to date we had five openings and we've received three applications. So the deadline is June 9th. So um, there would, if we were doing a first come first serve, there's still two uh, opportunities for. And those are two, two positions. Advisor, fiscal advisory committee members, not alternates, correct? Correct members. Yep. Thank you. I, I'll just say that I, I do support the compromise just because I don't think we should be voting on members of that committee because they should be a kind of an independent kind of pure part. Uh, they really are independent. They, they come to all our meetings and assist, but they write their own report at the end of the day. And it's either for, um, you know, the budget that the school board has proposed or it's against it, or it has recommendations. And in the past, those recommendations have been very helpful. And I think if we voted and, and you know, would look impartial and look like we're trying to seed that committee to, to pack it with people that are gonna vote for us. So I, I like the compromise by having alternates. That way, if it does, if some people are drop out or they move out of town, then we can keep people involved and keep it um, the same number of ideas of, available. So uh, the, good job by the committee. Dave, I had a question. Um, and I just dawned on me now, in a perfect world where if we had, you know, um, 
a host of people that we had to willow down, winnow down to uh, the number of applicants. Uh, I, I, if we, um, first of all, I, I think that the, the two alternates are a great idea. I think that really addresses the issue. But if we're making a policy, has anybody ever given a thought to a lottery? So we talked a lot about how we could fairly um, include the community in fiscal advisory. We talked about a lottery. We talked about pulling names out of a hat of people who applied. Um, but we just went back to the original intent of the fiscal advisory committee, which was to have community input. And if we had applications, how would people lead? W w lean? Would you lean toward the people with the financial background? You know, somebody who's a banker, somebody who's a CPA. How how would you lean? considering it's a fiscal advisory committee, where what we have now is we have a really good cross-section of the community, including senior citizens, who bring a different point of view to, um, you know, to the, to the group. So, um, you know, like us, we're all different. We felt like, um, it, you know, that was mo the most fair way to have the community represented on that committee. And maybe it won't turn out that way, but we don't have it even full now. So, um, and it just seemed like the fairest way to get the best cross-section. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments about any of the policies at this time? If not, welcome a motion to approve the policies as presented. I make a motion to accept the policy BDFA, EBCA, JLCJA, EBBB, JLCF and EEAG as written. <laughs> Is there a second? A first by Jessica and a second by John. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Just, just want to make sure you guys are all aware. Those motions are much easier to make than the ones that I'm making on the fly, okay, guys? Aye. Motion passes. So now we move on to the duly noted. Now we move on to the superintendent's report, and Dr. Garofalo will read what. Dr. Connors Gregorian has presented. Right. Reminder, this is um, from Dr. Mary Ann Connors Gregorian. Thank you again to our students and staff from Grinnell Ele Elementary School for their wonderful presentation this evening. Each of our schools has done an incredible job this year with their school board presentations. And tonight, Grinnell's enthusiasm was outstanding. We are most grateful for the support of our students' families at school board meetings and at all of the activities that occur within our school communities. Our Derry School District students and staff are truly remarkable and always so much fun to celebrate. I am confident that those viewing from home and as I am this evening are also enjoying our student presentations. Please know that I missed seeing my Grinnell friends in person tonight and will visit soon. As of May 24th, 249 kindergarten students have registered through the online process, an increase of 18 students since May 9th. The number of online registered kindergarten students at each of our schools thus far is Derry Village, four sections with 72 spots, 49. East Derry, three sections with 54 spots, 48. Barker, Five sections with 90 spots, 65. Grinnell Elementary School, three sections, 54 spots, 46. Remember that number, I'll be talking about that, why that number is actually higher. South Range, three sections, 54 spots, 41. Please note that some families have not registered online yet, have registered pending to be placed into the online system. This puts the Grinnell numbers of students, for example, already at 51, thus leaving only three open spots. This is important to bring to the boards and to the public's attention so that any new families entering the Grinnell district register as soon as they arrive. Last year on May 25th, 2021, there were 211 kindergarten students registered, 38 fewer students than the current online registration numbers. The school district's website, www.sau10.org, will direct families to the online registration form to register. If you do not have access to a computer, please contact your neighborhood elementary school to begin the registration process. 
There were positive reviews from our school administrative teams regarding kindergarten orientation held on Friday, May 20th. We are so happy to welcome our newest incoming kindergarten students. Registration continu continues to be ongoing, so please register as soon as possible, and your, home, your child's home school will then connect with you regarding the 22-23 school year. In addition to 22-23 kindergarten enrollment, projected enrollment continues to be reviewed in grades one through eight for our next school year. At this time, the classes and grades approaching or exceeding the district's recommended class sizes include grade five at Derry Village, 25, 25, and 26, grade five at East Derry, 23, 25, and 25, grade three at Grinnell, 21 across the board, and grade four at South Range, 24 and 25. The following is a list of vacancies here in Derry for next year. If you are interested in any of these positions, please apply online through our school district website, once again at www.sau10.org. Principal right here at West Runningbrook, assistant principal right here at West Runningbrook, school nurse at Derry Village, technology education teacher at Gilbert H. Hood, elementary special education teachers, out of district cord, um, special education coordinator, part time human resources assistant, special education facilitators, reading specialist, special education. Uh, um, reading specialist in special education, library assistant here at West Runningbrook, and a computer assistant at South Range. Important upcoming calendar dates include this coming Monday, May 30th, a day in which all of our schools will be closed in observance of Memorial Day. On Memorial Day, we take time to honor those who passed serving our country in the United States milita military. As a district, we are most grateful for all who have served and who are currently serving our country. Our band students from Gilbert H. Hood and West Running Brook Middle School will be marching in Derry's Memorial Day Parade on Monday, May 30th, and we know that they will do a superb job. Special thanks to band directors Ms. Emily Johnson and Mr. Ian Nelson, and to all of our students and their families who will be participating in this commemorative, commemorative event. Excuse me. Additional important end of year dates include the last day of school for students in grades deep through grade seven, which will be Friday, June 17th. Middle school, school promotion ceremonies will be hand, held on Thursday, June 16th at Pinkerton Academy beginning at 3.30, uh, 3.30 for West Running Brook and six o'clock? Six, right? I should remember that. Six o'clock for Gilbert H. Hood. Students will continue to be engaged in end of the year activities and events at their schools. Please know that we are most appreciative of our, vo of our volunteers who assist at each of these activities and events and for all that you do for our schools every day. And finally, our hearts are with those in Texas after today's, today's strategy tragedy near San Antonio in Uvalde, Texas, Robb Elementary School. We are with you in thought and send our most sincere condolences and support. Thank you. Thank you for reading that, Austin, and thank you, Marianne. Our next agenda item is the Business Administrator's Update. Jane? Okay, I have a couple handouts for you and I'm gonna to get to those in just a minute. I wanted to just start with some funding that um, all of the districts uh, received recently, which is in relation to uh, food service and it has to do with the supply chain assistance. Um, it's coming from uh, Department of Ed, but it's really they're really federal funds. State agencies will distribute supply chain assistance to um, school food authorities, which we are one, to be used exclusively to purchase unprocessed or minimally processed domestic food products, also referred to as commodities. We buy commodities all the time in our orders that we purchase through the state, um, ground beef and products like cheese, things like that at a very, very discounted price. 
Um, so these are the things that we're able to buy. It will help uh, districts like ours with challenges such as unanticipated cancellation of food and supply contracts, reduced availability of certain foods, unexpected substitution of certain products, unpredictable increases in food and supply prices, and other obstacles related to pricing and or availability that have been reported to or identified by state agencies that are administering the child nutrition programs. Dairy, um, each SAU is given a base amount of 5,000. And we were then allotted $44,109.73, and that's based on the enrollment claims submitted in 2021, uh, October of 2021. Um, and, and so the district was receiving a total amount of $49,109.73, um, which we have received. We have to keep documentation on um, everything that's pur purchased. Christina Labelzik is very experienced in this, and she will track and record all items that are purchased and used. I know that, you know, Last year, the year before, she had to, they discontinued the um, famous chicken patties that everybody loved. And um, so she has had some hardship finding consistent vendors. She does, uh, she is part of a biting group. So, um, you know, she's doing okay there, but there are definitely are items that have been discontinued, things that we can't get as readily. So I'm confident that Christina will do a really great job and that's a huge benefit to the food service program getting the additional $49,000. Um, okay, so if I continue with food service, um, I left three papers on your desk and one of them, if you look at it, says free reduced paid lunches, FY 2022. I'm not going to get into all of the numbers there. There are a lot of numbers, but this is just really informational for you so that you can see, remember, we're still asking people to fill out free and reduced applications, and we still get them. We wish we were getting more, um, and the reason we wish we were getting more, um, number one, it's additional funding for the district. A lot of our funding is based on free and reduced numbers, but number two, next year, uh, there are no free meals, unfortunately. The USDA has suspended the free meal program as of June 30th, and actually they have, we actually just got an email today with guidance from the state on having um, the, po the meal policies have to be updated, um, collections have to be updated. There's a lot of policies that are gonna have to be updated, and where you post all of those policies, um, you can't, we can't just have, I know we have a lot of policies that we just keep in the portal so when parents go on there, we also have to send the, the meal charging policies home because not every family has a computer, so we are um, mandatory that we have to send our policies home to families and make them readily available to them. So, but it's important, I wanted you to see where we are with free and reduced numbers at this point. If parents, um, feel that they are in a financial position that may have changed from the beginning of the year, you can always fill out a free and reduced application. Uh, what it does by applying now, it, it keeps your status until October. So that way, if you are approved for free or reduced, um, you don't have to worry about paying for meals in the beginning of the year while you're turning in an application um, to see if you're qualified because those meals, um, are the responsibility of the parent until they get qualified. So this would help a lot of parents, giving people a heads up if they fill out those free and reduced applications. Um, it would be really beneficial for parents and for the school district. Uh, if you flip over, um, flip over the other side, it's it's our current financials. We try to compare from same date one year over another. So we were using. Uh, in May 24th this year, May 21st, 4th of 2021. Now you can see where it says federal state. Looks like we um, received a lot of money, federal state, 1.7 million um, up until May, compare it to last year at the same time. But that's a timing piece. Sometimes uh, we get our reimbursement over a variety of days and um, 
we didn't necessarily receive 828,000 by year end more than last year. So um, just want to point that out that that is a timing piece. But if you were to go by as it stands right now for May 24th, that there is a positive um, balance statement for the food service program. Now, do we expect that we are going to have a lot of cost incurred for next year because um, salaries will increase? Uh, food products products are increasing in price and right now we're doing phenomenal sales because it's all free and we know that every family is not going to buy breakfast and buy lunch next year we know that's not going to happen so um, we need to be very conservative and try to retain any of those funds as long as possible to support the program okay that was that one uh, if you look at the the page it's on landscape. Quick it, question on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Some, yeah. That's okay. Retaining yeah. those funds, are there different rules for retaining those funds as there are for our general fund? Uh, no. You can, because um, you're carrying over and it's a separate um, fund balance. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. It just can't be in the red. Red is bad. So, um, okay, so if you look at the school board, school board financials, uh, Bill and I put this chart together, shows you the budget year to date projected on both revenue and expenditures. I want to just highlight some of the areas that were of importance to us and maybe they are to you. If you look at adult education tuition, they are done with classes for the rest of the year, so um, there is a shortfall in their budget of 47,000. Um, however, remember that they are a self funded program in our budget and she will not have spent um, that much in her expenditures to run the program. If you look down to the health trust surplus, I had to take it in as a revenue. So we received $993,000 as a revenue. Um, and we anticipated uh, that about 727 of that stays with the district as a rebate. Um, and we refunded the remaining portion to staff and that is um, accounted for in the expenditure side. So we took the money as a revenue and we paid out, it was a um, little over 300,000 I believe, that was um, a rebate to staff members. Um, the adequacy grant, somebody may just wonder why it's not exactly the same amount of money. The DOE revised their um, adequacy, updated April 1 of 2022 and we just had a $3,600 shortfall. Um, the kindergarten aid, remember, that was one-time state aid. Further down the page, uh, damaged equipment. I just thought I would bring that to your attention since that's really sort of new. Um, that goes to our tech usage um, policy for our students, and that is for the student Chromebooks that are either lost, damaged, screens may be broken or damaged, replacement of chargers, um, and each um, student has to sign the tech acceptable use and it also shows how much families would have to reimburse the district for. So this year we um, had to bill $2,750 in repair costs. And next charter school revenue, we haven't received it yet, but we usually bill in the month of May and it's a set amount. And per the contract, it's $24,035 for this year. Looking down at expenditures, uh, we have a budget, we have a year to date that's been spent, and then we have our encumbrance column, which are funds that are set aside and we are waiting for bills to come in. Uh, we have also included under the encumbrance of salaries and benefits, the uh, retiree payout, that's all been accounted for in here. Um, employee retirement, that is a shortfall of 38,000 and that's, um, if you remember, we changed when we had the IRS audit and we changed over the NECC tutors, they now were eligible for New Hampshire retirement and so that's why that is um, overexpended. And purchase sort of services, that is um, majority of those are contracted service providers. Uh, you can see Pinkerton Academy, regular education. At this point, there is 1.3 million that is unspent. Tuition for special education for Pinkerton, um, right now unspent 819,000, but we have not received, we always have remaining bills at the end with special education, so that likely will change. Um, 
and out of district tuition. So when you see the surplus at Pinkerton or even special ed for Pinkerton, and then you see the shortfall for out of district tuition, some of that will correlate, okay? Um, we have one student that attends Salem for high school. And in those situations, we do not pay more than we would for them to go to Pinkerton, okay? And the principal and interest, we are spent um, the exact amount for principal and interest. This line item is overspent because there was a 70, about a $70,000 penalty from the IRS for um, not only the um, contracted service providers who now have to be employees, but also each, typically each year, we are, um, I guess you could find, have it a fine assessed for the health insurance that um, we offer to uh, special ed assistants, and it has to be if the plan that we offer is not at a certain level or not affordable, um, then the district gets charged a penalty for not offering what they consider affordable health insurance. So typically each year we get fined about 30000 for that, which some may wonder, why do you take the fine? Why don't you offer the insurance? The cost to offer the insurance is exceedingly much greater than um, the fine. The last um, document that I just wanted to review with you, again, th this, is, this is all draft. Um, Bill and I worked on this today. This is the sample that I, I think we gave it out last year where we did the ABC so people could just follow along our methodology. If you remember last year, we had at the end of the year, if you combined the retained funds and unreserved funds, they both become fund balance. So you have to start with that um, total. That total of fund balance was $7,328,000. The board voted to retain our maximum 5%, which was allowable, and the 5% is calculated based on the uh, district budget less adequacy to get your net district assessment and you take 5% of that. So the 2.898 was our maximum 5% for that given year and the district returned 4,430,000 to offset taxes last year which would have affected your tax rate in October when they set the taxes. So moving forward to this fiscal year, you would go back and take your total fund balance from the prior year we did have an audit adjustment from the time that we had completed our audit, uh, co completed our projections and when the audit finally came in. Um, and there was a $56,000 difference. So for this purpose and exercise, I just wanted to highlight that for you. And so you get a new starting fund balance, $7,272,000. Again, that is the retained and the um, unreserved combined. We then look at the revenues that we've received to date this year, which is the 87 million. We would then subtract out the expenditures that we've paid to date, which is 74 million 215. We're now going to add back in the encumbrances from the prior year, and we are going to subtract the encumbrances that we have right now in the district, which is 13935000 Again, those encumbrances are, we always encumber funds, uh, busing, we haven't finished making our payments. Uh, basically, you can consider it reserving money for a um, specific purpose. When you do that, your balance becomes 7566000 now, I did a quick calculation on what I project 5% allowable would be, and I came up with 3,013,476. That's just my estimate. Um, that would have to get confirmed through the De uh, Department of Revenue. If you were to retain your maximum at 5%, that would leave, at this point, the unreserved fund balance at 4,552,000. When we prepared the budget, um, 
back in the fall, we had estimated a um, unreserved fund balance, I believe, of 3.7 million. So you can see that you have a difference of approximately 800,000 if we were to go with the 5% and only return um, what we had initially budgeted for. So right now we have, a, we have, a, we have more than we had budgeted for. Um, and so t tonight I'm not bringing this forward to a vote because this is just the first time you're seeing it. Um, this takes a lot of work for Bill and I to get to this point and um, wanted to get as accurate as possible. So I will be bringing it to the board for the next meeting and um, hopefully can have some discussions and have a vote by the end of the last uh, meeting of June. Uh, but we do have some larger expenses that are, that are coming before us. We just had the plan that just came before us and we would um, take that from our current budget so that would change that bottom line number. Um, as you remember, I've, I think we've been talking about it for two years or more. Um, re, um, redoing the water, we had two water projects, right? We had East Dairy and then we had Grinnell. Redoing the water line at Grinnell um, and originally when we had worked with the town and talked about connectivity, originally it was going to be connecting to Mount Pleasant Street. Now with further research, the town has looked at it, those pipes on, on Mount Pleasant are um, very old and the town is recommending that we extend to Hood School, Hood Road, okay? So originally, I think that we had talked about that that project would be in the range, somewhere in the $60,000 range. And the town has put our project and their projects out to bid so that we can get the best price. If we had gone to bid, we would not get the best price, but they, are, um, they put out more than a um, million dollars worth of uh, projects to go out to bid, so we were part of that. Now, the board doesn't have to do it, if they don't want to, um, but it would be closer to, I'd, I'd have to pull up the sheet, but I'm gonna give it to you for the next board meeting and I will put it in the packet and that's when we would make a vote on it. I'm not looking for a vote on that tonight, but the town is looking to um, acquire purchase orders for both projects so that they can secure the uh, bid winner and um, start projects next year. It doesn't look like our project would start until 2023, so um, just with the timeline, and they obviously have to do our project when school is out. Uh, so, but our project is looking, um, I think it was more of 169,000. Again, it's, I think it was maybe 180 feet of pipe, and then there would be a small, Jeremy would have to contract with a plumber to do some connectivity into the building. But as you know, there, there have been water problems at that school. To mitigate it, we flush the lines. <coughs> Excuse me. We flush the lines often. Um, the drinking water is safe. It has been tested. Uh, but it does need to have their water lines replaced. So I will have a full presentation. It will be in your packet for the next board meeting. But just wanted to bring that to your attention. Those are the things that you may want to consider when you look at this fund balance. Can I just ask a fund balance question? So mm -hmm. historically, we've discussed the unreserved fund balance either in July or August or sometimes even September. Are you able with certainly for us to vote on something by the end of June, will the books all be closed by then? It just, it's just a different time than we've traditionally voted, so it's just a, I was just curious why the change in time. I'm not, I, I like working ahead, I just wanted to understand it. Um, we don't have to do it in June. I mean, ideally, end of June, um, sometime in July. I would prefer not to wait until August. Um, the, I, I think that we'll feel very comfortable with our numbers by July. I mean, again, these are estimates, but it's giving you a pretty close snapshot. I will update this at the next board meeting so you can see where there, you know, there are services. We have, we do purchase orders all the time. We have kids that get outplaced all the time. So this number could change by however much. We have students who may leave a placement. So this number will change from now until the end of June. So if um, going to, you know, the first or second board meeting in July, that would be perfect for me. I'd be totally okay with that. Did, Fred, did you raise your hand, Brenda, or, uh, or no? I was Sorry, I was trying to find the Pinkerton line. The line with Pinkerton is from our budget. It's not what has been actually spent 
for our students at Pinkerton, correct? Because we always get money back from Pinkerton, or generally get money back from Pinkerton. That's not, this is unspent in our, bu in our budget, correct? I just want to be clear. This is what Derry budgeted for and what um, they have billed us to date for just dairy students. Typically, we do get a refund um, after the end of the fiscal year. It's sometime in the range, somewhere in the range, usually 20, 30,000 is where there's a refund from them. But I think that number is pretty close for Pinkerton. Are we okay if, if um, we just continue to bring these sheets at the board meeting so that you can? Yeah, that would be great. No, it's great to see the numbers earlier. I'm just not used to seeing them this early, which is why I asked yeah, the question. Yeah, neither are I, but um, neither Bill or I are. And um, it's, it actually is a complicated calculation to make sure that we are um, accurate in all of the expenditures. We look through all our purchase orders, see what's you know pending um, to make sure that they're as accurate as possible. But the reason why I brought it was because we are going to have some projects that it may interest the board in using some of those funds. Thank you. I had a quick question, Jane. Um, the 4-5 is the surplus, obviously. How does the 3-7 that we budgeted last year affect this number, or does it? Uh, well, it would. What I did in, in this sample here, because I uh, maxed out our 5% retained funds and that right at as of today's date right now the unreserved would be four five five two um if since we only budgeted 3.7 and that's what i used to estimate tax impact so when we moved the budget forward and i said we anticipate your tax impact would be x and i don't remember what it is off the top of my head um if you were to give back the surplus that tax rate that we estimated would just be lower by by eight hundred thousand or s the difference, yeah, yeah. Any other questions on on those? Um, I don't have a question about that. I had actually a question going back to the free and reduced lunch. Sure. Um, so, I and this is just anecdotal for me. I, like, I know my my daughter goes in and she she gets lunch every day, and I know she doesn't pay for it, and we are we are. It, it removes a lot of stress from our day, um, and I, I wonder what type of benefits we're seeing from this program um, for not only just from a own overall health and well-being standpoint, but what positive impacts does that have for kids for the rest of the day, and what type of position is it putting them in there, right? Like, are we seeing our teachers and administrators seeing um, that because maybe it's stress or uh, healthy eating habits, or, or what type of impacts are we seeing from this? I think if you asked probably any staff member in the district if having that USDA free food program was beneficial to their kids, I would think that everybody would say absolutely. Um, number one, it's social. We're getting more kids who are coming in to get breakfast and start their day. Kids that maybe haven't eaten from lunch the day before. Um, so they are, breakfast numbers are incredibly high. It starts their day off coming in to the kitchen. They're the f first, uh, you know, aside from if they take a bus, they're the first um, staff members that they see in the morning. Starts their day off. They have a meal. Um, kids having it for lunch. It's been phenomenal because it's not the kids who don't have money on their account. They, there's no difference. Everybody gets to eat. Um, Christina and I have talked about it a lot. We are, we're devastated that this was two years. We're thankful we had two years, but we're devastated. And I think that every school district would want to continue the USDA free food program. Um, yes. You lose your free and reduced numbers, which f affect you financially somewhere else. But the benefit for our students who are eating two meals a day every day makes me happy that um, they have full bellies when they leave the school. And I think it's been a phenomenal program for the school district. And aside from that, they're trying new foods that maybe they wouldn't eat before, never tried before. Um, you know, sales have gone up for our program. It's been a win for everybody, but the majority of the win is our students are not sitting in science class with a hungry tummy 
wondering where they're going to eat or can they borrow food from their friend or the kids that don't qualify for free or reduced so they're relying on their parents putting money on their account we do our best to make calls home it's a struggle and I am not looking forward to next year because we have to go back to turning kids away and that's the worst thing that it's our worst case scenario and we don't want to do it Relate, yeah. related to that did you have a follow-up question no I was just looking at these free and reduced and I'm and I, again I know we're not even uh, people are filling out applications but I look at Grinnell 30 percent are free and reduced and what would that number be if the actual number of people that needed those meals were filling out the applications, right? We, it, the USDA, this past few years has made it extremely easy because they don't have that application process. We appreciate the people that are doing those applications, but I got to imagine that number would be much higher. I, I mean, again, all across the board, I mean, you can see the, the I mean, this is a, a jarring snapshot. Related to the those numbers, one of the concern I have when I look at those numbers are one of them. I agree that it would be better if we could keep feeding people kids so they're not hungry throughout the day. Will these numbers? When will these numbers start affecting our funding? Because isn't some of our like Title One funding and some special funding tied to free and reduced numbers? And I, when I first joined the board, I thought our average was closer to 25 or 26, and that there were some schools closer to 40. When, at what point will those percentages start affecting our funding? Uh, we actually just got notification today from our um, Department of um, Child Nutrition from the state. So I can bring that for the next board meeting of what um, there is a snapshot or in a time that they're going to use based on free and reduced numbers. I'm just not sure what that, what year that's going to be. Um, so I can have that for you next meeting. But yes, some of our schools, I mean, Barca is generally has a high percentage. Grinnell has a high percentage. So, you know, our goal will be to reach as many families as possible. And we will start this, start now and try to reach out to families and use our home to school coordinators and um, put applications on counters to make it more accessible to them, do whatever we have to do to uh, you know, help parents along if they need help with that. Do you have anything else in your report tonight or? No, I'm good, thank well, you. Thank you very much. We will move on to the special education report, Laura Powers. All right, I will be very short and sweet as it's getting late. Um, we, I had given you all a chart um, that is the 2021 significant disproportionality three-year analysis um, and there's a lot of checks and balances in special ed with whatever information we put into um, our system of NISIS whether it be I for the IEPs for any kind of record keeping um, lots of checks and balances we get lots of report cards throughout the year um, as far as how we're doing with our transitions how we're doing with our um, student testing, how we're doing with our preschool outcomes. Um, you know, it really starts at preschool and goes all the way up through high school. Um, this particular report is, it takes a three-year snapshot. Uh, we get it every year, so it's it, it just it's progressive. Um, and really looks at um, whether or not there's any kind of discrepancy around our identification of students, our placement of students, and disciplinary action um, with students based on race and, ethnic and ethnicity. Good Lord. Um, so it, it is something that we have been higher in. I remember back when I was a facilitator, um, we had done some investigating because our numbers were getting a little bit high. Um, and so I was very pleased to see how low the numbers are right now. The state sets um, at the kind of the threshold at 3.5, um, and we are nowhere near that in any of our categories. Um, we're hovering around um, the one um, with that, and you know, so there's no areas that we are being monitored for um, now or hopefully in the future. So we'll continue to keep that, keep an eye on that. That's one of our data points. Thank you um, very much. The only thing I did want to add to um, what Austin had said is we, are, we can continue to need paraprofessional support. Um, our NECC programs, um, we are 
certainly looking for tutors uh, for that. Uh, again, one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals, um, speech pathologists, I don't know if I heard that or not, um, but those are areas that we are um, continue to look. We've been looking all year and um, certainly over the summer we need those positions uh, filled so we can start the school year strong. Um, NECC is open all summer um, so we would like to um, continue to staff that program as we go um, as well to open up room for other students that we may need to send out a district based on staffing. So that's just want to put an extra plug in for that. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll move on to FYI. We have the May 1st enrollment report included in our packet. After that, the next item is committees. Do any, before I move on to manifest, does anyone want to report on any committees? Just quickly say that the, um, the co-curricular committee that was created with this past collective bargaining agreement has finished its work and will have a report in one of the June meetings, I believe. And also the Pinkerton or the high school committee um, will have a report in one of the June meetings as well um, based on the contract discussions. Are there any other committee reports? If not, I would take a motion for the manifest. I move to approve the manifest of two million nine hundred and eighty four thousand five hundred and thirty four and thirty seven cents of that we have general payroll of one million one hundred and thirteen thousand four hundred and ninety seven and twenty six cents and general expense of one million eight hundred and seventy one thousand thirty seven dollars and eleven cents and we do one at a time right Ms. two of them here yeah need a second second <coughs> uh, first by David and a second by Derek. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Oh, it's just a duplicate. I'm sorry. Okay. It's the same one. <laughs> we are now we are now on to delegations and individuals. People are welcome to come up and speak for three minutes about something on the agenda. I would just ask that you give your name and address for the record. Good evening, Butch Tempe, Bowers Road. Uh, a couple things. Um, first, on behalf of Richard Tripp, uh, he was wondering uh, with the, uh, the facilities presentation, um, the interest rate uh, already going up from five to 5.5. Um, do we have any estimations of where that's going to land when you know, it comes time for all of this? Uh, no, we I don't. Mean, but. Um, actually, I can check in with the town because I think they just financed a bond recently for the fire department, okay. and I can see where their interest rate, um, where the actual interest rate landed. They were being um, overestimating, really. So okay, and then the, the contract uh, or the construction costs. So, for example, Hood, thirty million dollars. Um, how much higher do we think that's going to go when you know we green light this and actually start the actual construction? I mean, it seems like costs continue to skyrocket. And I mean, at any point, you know, we could be looking at, you know, millions more. So uh, I just, that's a con concern of mine as well. I mean, when we go and go forth with the bond and, you know, next thing you know, prices are extremely different. Um, where are we gonna, you know, how do we react to that? So the bond needs to have the number that we're actually voting on and we are allowed to spend but right now we only have order of magnitude costs, so we don't know what those exact costs are, but there will be an exact amount for the bond. Okay, it, it, but I just wanna make sure that you, know, you guys are going to you know, make sure that you have backup plans where it's like, oh, you know, we, we, we approved the bond, we got the, the bond approved, and then all of a sudden you know, we have additional increases in construction costs and, and whatnot, you know, where, what's gonna be sacrificed in the plans, what's, you know, it's just that we need to be looking at that, stuff like that. Um, and then the, uh, the last part was the, um, the building aid. So the 45%, you know, it's such a question, you know, question mark. I mean, even Paul mentioned that, you know, he doesn't feel comfortable or confident, you know, in us getting that, and I, I agree. Um, you know, realistically, what do we really feel is what we're gonna get? 
you know, are we going to get the, the, the 45? Are we going to get the 38? Are we going to get the 30? Um, you know, uh, and then along with that, um, as far as the, as part of the plan that they, or that the, or the application process that they look at, um, do they look at the, uh, the report that, you know, the thousand page report, I'm not saying they're going to go through the whole thousand page report, but do they reference that when making that decision? Do we know? Projects are ranked based on the level of need they're addressing. So they will be including in that report proof of the conditions of the schools and why those schools were chosen. And they are, we were told, they are ranked based on level of need. And the more need you have, the supposedly the higher you should rank. Okay. But I can't be more specific than that. Right. No, I, I get that. It, it, but what's, what concerns me is, um, you know, Brenda's already identified, you know, some, some inconsistencies in the report, um, you know, where is that going to fare when, you know, if someone decides to walk off some of these items and they turn around like, oh, look at that. That's, that's not accurate. Oh, that's not accurate. Um, I just think we need to ensure that we have, um, like you guys had discussed, uh, that updated list of what has been corrected. I think that document is crucial um, to make sure that we are, uh, are, are covering ourselves. Um, and then just real quick. Uh, so. You know, a couple things that were talked about tonight. Um, you know, Paul mentioned that he was hesitant to send students into the, the buildings in the current condition. Um, you know, we've heard from John, Jonathan saying that we need to be financially prudent. Um, also, um, we have to look at, uh, Paul had mentioned about having to look at the money uh, and uh, looking into the future. Have we been doing that consistently over the years. Um, you know, we keep talking about how um, these schools are in such disarray and need to be replaced and it it's financially makes sense. And I agree, financially, this project makes sense. Um, my concern is that we allowed it to get to this. And then we hear in, in previous meeting uh, that, you know, the blame is in Concord or in DC for lack of funding. Um, and then in the presentation, it states that um, the maintenance costs are constantly cut because that's what the voters want, because that's what we need to do in order to pass a budget. Um, I just feel as though there's a, a lot of blame game. Um, so I just want to close with asking you guys, um, some of you are brand new to the board, some have been on the board for quite some time. How often are you walking through our, school, our schools, touring our facilities. Um, I know, and I'm not saying anything against Jeremy and his team. Uh, I think they, they do the best that they can with what they have to work with. Um, but are you guys walking off these schools yourself uh, and, and looking at it, whether it be once a year? Um, and if not, you really should um, to make sure that we're, we're following up on that, uh, that we're, we're, we're taking a look at um, how our schools are uh, in the conditions and not talking about it here and then the next you know we're uh, we've waited way too long and uh, we're at a point where we're having to build more new schools so um, that's my ask of you guys if I mean I don't need to you guys to respond but if you're not I, I suggest you guys start doing that can I respond Erica yeah sure um, we used to have a building and grounds committee that did walk the buildings twice a year with um, our whoever was in charge of maintenance at that time, it wasn't Jeremy, um, and Jane, the principal. So we talked, we talked directly to the people who were in the buildings, the principals, about what their needs were and, what, and also what we saw. Um, that, that's changed, so we don't do that anymore. I will tell you that I obviously have, I do walk the buildings and, mm -hmm. and look at things and you know, I, I'm, I have a little bit finer. I'm always saying, wait, what about that door? Or, you know, those kind of things. I don't know the construction problems, but I do see other things. But I, I think that committee had a lot of value, but it's just, it's changed to be a facilities committee. So it, it doesn't do the same thing. Okay. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to speak tonight? If not, I will close delegations and individuals and move on to other business. I have one I of other business. Tina Gilford had emailed me and asked
asked me to let people know that the supervisors of the checklist will be holding a public session on Tuesday, May 31st from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. It is the last chance for voters to make any changes to your voter registration or to register to vote before the filing period. You can also register or make changes at Town Hall during the normal business hours until 4 p.m. on May 31st. She also wanted people to know that you can check your party affiliation at Town Hall or online at the Secretary of State's website. The filing period for state and federal offices is June 1st through June 10th. Candidates for state representative and Republican delegates file at Town Hall with the town clerk June 1st through June 9th are normal business hours. Friday, June 10th, the clerk will be at Town Hall until 5 p.m. and you must file in person. Candidates for any other office and anyone filing for any office as undeclared must file at the Secretary of State's office in Concord. Please see their website. If you have any questions about the upcoming elections, please reach out to the town clerk, town school moderator, or supervisors of the checklist. So that is all from Tina. Does anyone else have any other business? Brenda? Um, I learned earlier, uh, early last week that um, Scott Garish, who used to do our enrollment projections, was amazing. He lived in the community. He didn't have fancy software and spreadsheets and whatever, but he was so accurate. and. Um, even when we had soft numbers, he was not that far off. Um, but he passed away, and I just wanted to recognize him and um, his family because he gave so much to us and um, gave us so much benefit. So I I'm saddened that he passed. I was hoping to catch up with him in the summer when he came back to visit and talk about projections, actually. So, um, but he'll be missed, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. But uh, the, I was kind of shadow that too just you had shared some of his old data with me at one point and Davis has done a pretty good job I think but the firms we'd used previous to them the old numbers were still better than theirs when it came time to look at the actual enrollment each year it was absolutely me like third 20 30 years ago he had predict predicted out the numbers that were closer than um, the previous firm we had used before Davis um, so he's a, he was an amazing person and knew the community and just how to manipulate math enough to figure it out going forward so he'll be missed is there any other business at this time if not i would welcome a motion to adjourn in a second first by derek a second by paul all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed motion passes meeting closed thank you very much